It was a long time ago, before cell phones were prevalent, and I was a mom in my early thirties who had just driven our kids to the pediatrician. The Macon, Georgia doctor's office was an hour away from our home, and I was just taking the two youngest of my three. Because we lived so far away, their office always gave us the last two appointments of the day, and we were grateful. The doctor had just built a new building off of a fresh spur of the highway, so the location was quite isolated in every direction, but a very nice facility compared to his old spot by the hospital there. His new building was also pretty far back on the new lot, and my car was only one of four or five cars in the parking lot when we arrived. I parked near the front door, removed the kids from their car seats, and for the next hour or so we waited. We then saw the doctor, paid, and finally exited back outside. Mine was the only car left in the lot as I loaded the children in their car seats for our trip home. But as the receptionist locked the front glass doors, my car somehow wouldn't start when I turned the key. There was just an odd clicking noise. Gathering the children once again, I knocked on the door until someone allowed us back in. I asked to borrow their phone to call a nearby garage for service. I found one in the phone book and the man said he would come out there, but it might be a bit. So I told him my location, left to go back out to the car, rolled down all the windows and loaded the children back into their seats once more as we waited. Soon we watched as all the lights were turned out in the building again and everyone left, their cars departing one by one from behind the building somewhere, leaving us now completely alone in the parking lot. As it was still light, I spent a lot of time trying to tend to the children, digging through our car for snacks in a bottle making sure that they were not getting too hot. All the mom stuff. Although the service station attendant said that it was probably going to be quite a while, I was pleasantly surprised when a truck pulled into the empty parking lot soon after, and a man got out of his pickup, smiled, and nodded to me. He said he was going to raise the hood. He was middle-aged and a bit scruffy, but quite frankly, many gas station attendants sometimes look that way, especially at the end of the day. I was grateful when he began doing something under the hood almost immediately. I sat down again in the driver's seat with the door open, waiting for him to tell me to try the engine, but he seemed to be taking a long time checking the connections, and I longed for him to just grab jumper cables, yet he never did. Without getting out of the car, I asked him what he thought was wrong. He said, oh, it's just a loose wire, not the battery, and he continued whatever he was doing. I couldn't see his face at all from where I was sitting, but his hands were slightly visible through that long horizontal slit between the windshield and the raised hood as we waited. More than once, he said that it was merely a loose wire, and if I would just come up here really quick, he would show me which one it was, so it would never happen again. I remember kind of smiling and shaking my head, saying that sadly there was no reason to show me anything, as I didn't know anything about cars. I just thanked him and continued to stay in the driver's seat, again, just waiting for the inevitable signal to try to start the ignition that was surely coming at any moment. At one point, I remember thinking that he definitely was flirting as he spoke, but I was trying above all to be polite and kind, as he was indeed helping us. We were hot and tired and miserable, and truthfully, I was distracted with the kids. Oddly enough, he was starting to sound a little frustrated with me because I wouldn't come up and look at the engine. I remember thinking that I certainly didn't want to make him mad where he left us there all alone, with the sun sinking so quickly. And then the strangest thing happened. Another truck suddenly pulled into that desolate parking lot, and as it did, the nice guy working underneath the hood suddenly slammed it shut, ran to his truck, started it, and drove away very quickly without even saying a word of goodbye. I was both confused and a little anxious when he did this, because I didn't know who was arriving now. I even remember feeling a bit frightened that he suddenly left me there alone with two little ones, defenseless. Why wouldn't he at least stay and speak to whoever was parking next to me? It certainly seemed the suddenly gentleman thing to do. I looked around and was very aware, once again, that there were no visible cars on the road, no homes or businesses nearby, and the sun was continuing to set quickly. As this new pickup truck pulled in next to me, I got out of the car once more, 
this time more apprehensively. Upon exiting, though, he immediately introduced himself, and his name and voice seemed to match who I'd spoken to on the phone much earlier. He then actually called me by name, apologizing for being so late, and finally smiled and stared toward the road, pointing and asking who the man was that had just left so suddenly. Relieved and unfazed, I just smiled back in surprise and told him, Well, I don't know. I thought all this time he was you. We both laughed slightly as he then grabbed jumper cables, walked to the front of my car, raised the hood, and started to work. I immediately sat back in the driver's seat once more, suddenly grateful that, with luck, the air conditioner would be blowing full blast shortly, and once again checking the children. While listening for the familiar words, try it. I had my back completely turned when he surprised me by suddenly coming over to the driver's side door. In the strangest voice, he said, Uh, ma'am, is this yours? And when I looked into his hands, he was holding a long, thin, dagger-looking device that was about a foot and a half in length. It appeared to be very old and covered with reddish rust, yet on one end it had tiny, circular small finger holes as if it was a mix of a long thin sword and scissors oddly combined. I remember being amazed but not frightened, and I asked where he had found them. Under the hood, he replied. I said, just matter-of-factly, that I had never seen them before, but how weird it was that those things had somehow been stuck and undiscovered in my car for all those years. I shook my head in surprise. He continued to stand there and stare at them, unbelievingly, and he looked oddly pale too, kind of like he couldn't find the words to speak for a bit, just continuing to stare at the unusual object. Honestly, I didn't care one bit about it. All I could think of was getting the car going, letting me pay him, and then leaving. He didn't say anything else. He just quickly set them on the curb, started his truck, and then signaled for me to start the jeep, and when it immediately caught, my three-year-old cheered. Grateful, I quickly turned on the air conditioner full blast, rolled up all the windows, aimed the air vents back towards the back seat, and reached for my purse to pay out. I stood up and took a few steps to meet him so I could hear the amount I owed him. With both of our vehicles running, he came back around to my driver's side, but instead of handing me the bill, he irritated me a bit by walking right past me and picking up that weird object once more. Man, he said slowly. I want you to look at these one more time, and he held them out for a closer inspection. This time I moved a bit closer and actually really looked. In his hands, the item still appeared incredibly large, possessing an almost bayonet-looking quality, except for the two strangely small loops on one end. I'd never seen anything like it, and I told him so. As he held it, he spoke quietly and slowly to me as if trying desperately to make me understand something that was somehow still going over my head. These weren't hidden somewhere in the engine, man. They hadn't been out there very long at all, because they were sitting right on top. They must have just been put there. I shook my head no and half smiled as I said, but they're obviously very old and rusty, to which he pointed more closely and replied, Yeah, but see how sharp they are. These look like they've just been sharpened. And when I looked down, he was right. The long, skinny, dagger-like shape was unusual, but by far the oddest quality was just how sharp it appeared to be. The edges at the tip where the rust had been removed were gleaming silver. As I paid him, his final words to me were, Ma'am, I don't know what was about to happen here, but I'm really glad I pulled up when I did. He quietly thanked me when taking the payment, told me that I probably needed to call the police when I got home, and then asked me where I wanted the item. I didn't want to touch it, I didn't want to take it at all, but I released the back window so we could place it inside. We both then left the lot together, him turning one way, me turning the other towards the small winding highway that would lead me home, still an hour away. I did indeed contact the Macon police the moment we arrived home, and I got the children inside safely. But although they listened politely, they declined when I offered to bring them the scissors-like thing later. 
The officer I spoke to said that they sounded as if they were specialized surgical shears from my description and measurements on the phone, which I found quite disturbing, as you can imagine. I remember wondering how he would even know that, why he would say that. I had tried so carefully not to touch any of the surfaces, hoping they might be able to lift any prints or test it for blood if they wanted, but the story seemed to bore him a bit and he didn't seem interested. His attitude insinuated that, as there was no longer an emergency, it was of no importance now. At the very end of the call, as if to wind things up, he did say that it sounded as if I was very lucky, and that I might want to keep the shears for a few days, just in case someone from his office got back with me later, but that was all. I wrapped them carefully in newspaper and placed them in the brick storage unit behind our house, and there they remained for several more years untouched. That is until we moved away and I finally, not wanting to bring them across several states, reluctantly threw them in the trash. Around that time though, if you look through old news reports, women were going missing all over Georgia. Some bodies were eventually found, but others remain missing to this very day. I have often wondered what would have happened if the service station attendant hadn't arrived when he did. If my children would still have a mother, if I would have still had my son and daughter, if I would have missed all these years with them, I guess I'll never know, but I learned something very important about myself that day. I always felt that I was pretty aware of my surroundings, that I was pretty good at reading people and staying safe, but because I was exhausted and tired and hot and stranded in a different city, my common sense and intelligence simply left me for a bit and wasn't working at the time, and many of my friends and family still think that our car trouble that day and my lack of awareness could easily have cost us our lives. I love doing my grocery shopping at night. It's far less crowded and kind of therapeutic for me. This happened a few nights ago. I'm just leaving from my shift at the hospital, so it's night time. I've loaded my groceries into the car and I'm heading home. I'm very much aware of my surroundings at all times, especially at night. I leave the parking lot with no one seemingly around me, pedestrians nor others also leaving in their vehicle. The way home for me requires that I turn left onto the road home. I shit you not. As soon as I've made my turn onto the highway, there's a car right behind me also pulling onto the highway with me. It looked like they were flashing lights behind me, and I panic think, shit, did I make a wonky traffic move? I also thought that maybe there was a police cruiser further up the road, but no, there was nothing. I figured it was just the car behind me hitting a bump in the road, and it was just their headlights reacting to that. Okay, cool, phew. Now this road has two lanes and I need to make a right turn off it later, so I get over in the right lane. Unfortunately for me, there's a line of traffic full of others needing to turn right as well, sooner than where my turn is. So I safely go back into the left lane to bypass the congestion. As I'm bypassing the congested traffic, I see flashing lights again. I think, okay, cool, I get it dude, and I move over back into the right lane. Once it's clear thinking, they're definitely trying to tear up on the road, right? Wrong. Whoever this person is slowly creeps up beside me and coasts alongside me, flashing their lights. It's a black luxury car, a BMW. I try looking into their cab to see if maybe it's someone I know, but I can't make out a damn thing. They continue to ride beside me for a few more blocks until my gut suddenly clenches like a fist. I finally let off the accelerator and let them coast farther ahead. They seem to try to slow down too, but I'm having none of it, and slow down even more till my turn. I don't even signal, I just veer off and head home. So what did I encounter that night? My headlights were active, so they couldn't have been signaling for me to turn them on. They were not trying to bypass me. My car is brand new, so there should be no weird issues happening that they could have been trying to tell me. What the hell were they trying to do with me? I was, and still am, free the fuck out.
I'd like to start off with a few facts about myself and my ex-boyfriend. I was 18 when we started dating, and he was 24. Prior to our relationship, he'd been married, and he'd abused his ex-wife. They got divorced, and she was filing a restraining order against him, and he violated it. So when we were dating, he had a felony charge. This incident happened in August, on a 90-degree day. I was dating my boyfriend for about 8 months when I decided it wasn't working out and I wanted to break up with him. He didn't want to and I'm not good with my emotions, so I essentially shut him out of my life. I didn't respond to text messages, phone calls, anything. A few days after we broke up, he came to my parents' house to try to talk to me. My mom answered the door and I told her I didn't want to talk to him, so she asked him to leave. He got kind of upset because he just wanted to talk so she threatened to call the police on him. He still wouldn't leave, so she got the phone and called the police when he got in his car and left. They caught up with him down a street that was just outside of our neighborhood and gave him a warning to stay away from me. One day my mom took my younger sister to a soccer practice and my dad was at work, leaving me home alone. I was lying on the couch when I heard a knock at the back door. I looked up and he was standing there, he motioned for me to come outside. I rolled my eyes and went back to my game. That pissed him off and he shouldered the door. The frame cracked. At that point, I think he was just doing it to scare me into coming outside. But when the frame cracked, there was no going back. I feel like to him, the situation spiraled out of control and there was no turning back. I never talked with him about it. Those are just my thoughts. He shouldered it again and the door burst open, taking the frame off the wall with it. I sat up and shouted, What the fuck are you doing? Because I really thought he was just trying to scare me and this was fixable. He picked me up and put me over his shoulder and walked out the back door. We were approaching his car and I expected to be put down or even shoved into the passenger seat, but he used his remote and popped a trunk. As soon as I realized what he was doing, I shifted my body weight and he dropped me. He immediately put me into a headlock until I couldn't breathe and went limp. He dragged me the rest of the way to his car. He picked me up and threw me into the trunk, grabbed my cell phone and then shut the trunk. As soon as I felt him get into the car, I started looking for a latch to open the trunk. After about five minutes of searching, I realized there wasn't one. I started to kick the back seat. The seat separated from the trunk a bit and I was able to push and squeeze my head through to get some air. I ended up crawling into the back seat, but he kept me down so the other cars couldn't see. He drove for a long time, about 45 minutes or so. We pulled into a campground-like park. We sat and talked for a while until he asked if I was hungry. We went to Pizza Hut. I remember standing in the restaurant wondering why no one was questioning why I was there without shoes or socks. I figured no one knew I was gone yet since no one seemed to be looking for me. When we got out of the restaurant, he let me turn my phone on and text my family. After the text was sent, he turned my phone back off and tossed it into the glove box. We ate and he told me he was not going back to jail. He started driving back to his workplace to get his shotgun. It was dark by the time we got there and as he pulled in, he realized the police were there looking for him. He snuck out of the car and was gone for less than two minutes. I saw him running back to the car and he told me they tried to tase him but missed. He went in reverse and did a backwards U-turn to get out of the lot and then floored it. We were going about 60 miles per hour being followed by the police and he told me to get my phone out and call 911 to tell them that he was dropping me off on the side of the road and also to have the cops back off. I knew that wasn't going to do anything but I called anyway. The lady on the other end had no idea what I was talking about, so I just hung up. He was about to get on the highway, but he saw the police had laid down spike strips, so he veered off onto a side road. It was a dead end, and he ended up crashing into a tree. The police surrounded us and shouted for me to get on the ground. I was handcuffed and put into the back of a police car. He was put into a separate car. The police stood and talked for what seemed like forever. Then they took me out of the car and uncuffed me only to put me into a different set of cuffs and back into a different car. I guess each officer has their own set of handcuffs to go with their own cruiser. Once everything was settled and they found out who we were, 
I was uncooked and put in the back of a black SUV with two other people, who I assumed to be investigators. I was taken back to my hometown and reunited with my family. It turns out some neighbor kids were out playing when he dragged me out of the house and saw the whole thing. They ran inside and told their parents, who called the police. My mom was doing about 90 miles per hour down the highway to get home once she found out. The kids who told their parents were given awards and were thanked by the city for bravery. The text message I sent was sent in a group message, one to my mom and dad and the last to my sister. The house was filled with police and investigators when the text went through. My sister's phone received the text first. I was told she got it, shouted, It's from Chrissy, and every single cop in the house rushed over to read it. They were able to use the cell phone signal and some towers to triangulate and find out the location where I sent the text. They sent the police, but we were gone by the time they got there. I was subpoenaed four times and showed up four times, only to have each trial suspended or rescheduled. I wasn't subpoenaed when the trial was actually held, so my family and I didn't know it happened until afterwards. The scary thing is, he got four years, and he's out now. This happened a year ago, but I still think about it. Me and my friends had the munchies and wanted to go to Taco Bell at 2am, so we took my mom's car and went on our journey. On our way home though, my friends took a wrong turn and ended up in a cul-de-sac. As we were turning around, a resident on the street gets into his truck and starts pulling out right in front of our car. Us, thinking he's going out somewhere, waits for him to go, but he just sits there for a second before getting out and coming toward the driver's side. He walks up to my friend driving and starts yelling at her to slow down, that she's going too fast down the street, this and that, and then he started banging on my friend's window and tried opening the door. I can see him doing this, so I tell my friend to drive because I don't want to be sitting there anymore. She pulls the fuck off and he jumps in his car behind us. Halfway out of the street, I noticed he was following us. I stuck my entire upper half out the window and yelled at him. At this point, he's chasing us while I'm giving my friends directions back to my house. All of our phones are dead or at 1%. He ends up in front of us and cornered us in another cul-de-sac up the street. My friend is driving in people's lawns to get away. Eventually, he followed us all the way to my home. My friends ran inside to tell my mom. I run straight for the car yelling at him. He asked me what I yelled out of the car and I said to his face, You fucking baby ass bitch. He gets upset and almost gets out of the car when he sees my mom come out of the house. He tries leaving, so I stood behind his truck, shouting out his license plate numbers. She makes it to him and his entire demeanor changes, acting like he's the innocent one, like he was scared. I was told to go inside and my mom obviously gives him some words of wisdom. She tells me he followed us home because someone ran over his dog a while back because they were speeding through his street but it still gives no excuse to follow teenage girls home. Hey, I'm a 24-year-old lad living in the UK. I work as a pharmacist at a hospital, and I usually do night shifts. My workplace is just a few lots away from home, so I just walk every night. A few months ago, while I was on my way to work at around midnight, a car stopped in front of me and the person rolled down their window. There was a guy inside wearing a scrub suit. He had dark hair, a bit chubby, and he was probably around my age. Hey, where are you heading? Let me drive you to work. I politely declined. The guy looked harmless and I guess being polite wouldn't hurt. He looked pretty normal, but there was something in his eyes that unsettled me. He didn't go away after that and kept on insisting to drive me to work. That's when I snapped and told him that I was waiting for my boyfriend. He seemed to believe it and he just drove away. Days passed when I got a chat request. I tried to check the profile and saw that it was the same guy offering to give me a ride to work. How he got my name, I have no idea. I didn't pay his chat any attention and just went on with my pretty busy life. 
Two days after that, I got another message from him saying, You were smiling earlier. You look cute. After reading that message, I had felt like I'd been splashed with an ice cold bucket of water. Was he at the hospital? I didn't want to know. I told him to stay away from me and fuck off. Days had passed and I'd almost forgotten about this guy when I saw him standing in the hallway looking at me while I was exiting the room during rounds. He tried to approach but I beelined to the other hallway and went back into the pharmacy. That's when I started freaking out and told my boyfriend. He advised me just to drive to work instead of walking and I did right after that night. I also blocked him to avoid any unwanted future creepy messages. So far I haven't seen him in months and I want to keep it that way. Last year around this time, my friend D, my other friend Jay, and I went on a camping trip. It was deep in the woods in Alberta, Canada. The trip was going good. It was in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no bars, nothing. But we paint, listened to music, and all that jazz. One day, D and Jay were both sleeping in the tent. I was sitting outside alone. I start hearing this screaming. John, John, help me. John, where are you? And that repeated four times. The same way. The exact same pacing. I'm not going to die in the woods, so I didn't check it out. I stayed where I sat. When the other two got up, I explained what I heard. Me and Dee went to the river that was close by, leaving Jay alone at the tent. We came back 40 minutes later, and Jay is sitting in his pants. He explained that he heard the exact same thing as me, including how the pauses were. A few months later, me and Jay went back there, but it was just the two of us. On the last day, me and Jay had this gut feeling that we were going to die if we stayed the last night. It was one of the gut feelings that you trust. I know it wasn't anxiety, it was a feeling of literal terror. And we're going back there with Dee in a few days. The other day, my roommate ordered DoorDash to our place. The guy came and left it at the door, but then he knocked over our welcome sign and stayed in the vehicle for 10 minutes. But he wasn't sitting in his car or on his phone. He walked around the outside of his car, staring at the house, pretending to mess with his car. He was just waiting around doing nothing for a whole last 10 minutes. We wouldn't come out to get the food because this huge man was just waiting outside. He had blocked our only car in as well. We set off the panic alarm on the car, and he was literally less than a foot away from it. He didn't even flinch. We felt really uneasy and were too scared to get our food. We got it all on our ring doorbell and gave a description to the local police in case the guy does something else. But DoorDash just gave us $10 in credit when I reported it. Now that I'm safe at home, I'm beginning to process what happened, and I don't know if I'll be able to sleep. I had friends from out of state come into town for the weekend, and we decided to go downstairs for drinks. I drove separately because they were coming from an Airbnb. Around 2am we decided to leave, and my car was parked in a garage a block over from where my friends parked. I say my goodbyes and begin the short walk to the garage. As soon as I hit the corner... Two large men begin walking behind me. I try to subtly put space between us. They suddenly whistle loudly and shout, but I don't see anybody ahead. I don't acknowledge, but I start walking faster. I pass an alley to my left, and there's another guy walking out of it towards me. At this point, I'm no longer subtly walking fast. I make it into the garage, and I park by the entrance, so I quickly slip into my car and lock the doors. I turn around to look behind me, 
and I see the guys that were following me stop at the entrance of the garage and watch my car. They talk for a minute before they spread out and stand across the entrance, blocking the exit. I don't move. I keep watching until other vehicles start coming in, forcing them to move. I take that opportunity to quickly pull out and floor it out of there. I could be paranoid, but my instincts were telling me something was up as soon as I saw them. And now, I can't sleep. It was around 2 a.m. on a Friday night after a party. Me and my girlfriend are at the local state park admiring the moonlight and each other's private parts at the lakeside. I hear slow, calculated footsteps behind us, the kind of slow that makes you think someone's trying to hide their approach. I don't remember if it was crunching leaves or what that gave them away, but I'm just glad I turned around. I look back and see two shadow figures were there coming towards us from the road and maybe 50 yards away. My car was behind them, and we were definitely the only people in the entire park at this time late at night. I stand up and I say out loud something like, Guys, what's up? They don't respond, but keep moving toward us until I say to them with a little more tension, Stop moving. They stop maybe 30 feet from us and are a little more visible now. One's got a tank top and camo pants, the other has full camo pants and jacket, and what I'm pretty sure was a black paintball mask. The tank top guy starts with, Hey guys, sorry, we didn't mean to scare you. Then he says they were just noticing my car parked there illegally, and that cops ticket there all the time at night. So I said thank you for letting us know. But then they didn't move. Awkward silence. I said, Great, thank you. Again. And still nothing except Tank Top tried to talk about parking tickets again. I noticed Paintball Mask had his hands stuffed in his jacket pockets, so I thought it was time to ask him to remove them. More awkward silence. Of course, he didn't. So I asked him again. More silence. He finally removed them, and that was that. The guys walked away and kind of disappeared into the woods. We ran to our car spooked and couldn't stop checking in the rearview mirror. We checked the computer when we got home and found all kinds of complaints were being made there about assaults on couples at night. In the 80s, there was a serial murder on couples there too, who'd never been caught. All around, it was spooky, and until now, I have unnecessary laser focus hearing behind me at night. So I got kicked out of my house when I was 15, and I'd been homeless periodically, and this was one of those times. It was cold, and I didn't want to be sleeping outdoors, so I had to go through social services. They put me into what's called emergency housing. The people who approved the standards of some of these places need to be fired yesterday. They sent me to one of the worst neighborhoods ever, into a house where I was the only female with four grown-ass men for housemates and there was no one there supervising anything. Half the house was made up of a burnt-out porch. There were both rats and roaches of monstrous proportions, and usually no heat or hot water. Me and one of the guys ended up sharing a room. His name was Jay. One of our other housemates I never actually saw. Another one was usually decent, but he drank so much every night that he forgot how his keys worked so he was usually found passed out on the floor outside of his door. And then there was the crackhead of this story, C. This guy was creepy as hell and he had a lot of prostitute friends. They knew that our front door lock generally didn't work, so it wasn't uncommon to run into some random hookers making grilled cheese in the middle of the night when I got up to pee. Me and Jay also liked to mess about with C because number one, we were stupid teenagers who didn't realize that crackheads could be dangerous. And two, we were both assholes who didn't have much to do. So we liked to screw around with C because we kept telling him to please stop lining his teeth up on the windowsill by the kitchen table when they fell out from said crack usage because it's, well, 
you know, not the most appetizing thing to look at when you're eating. So one night, after a new tooth was added, we decided that we would just turn everything in the kitchen upside down. Then we would wait for him to come into the kitchen and pretend like it was normal. We spent a good four hours doing this. It was almost impressive. It worked too well because he completely lost his shit after we kept telling him that the kitchen looked normal. It should also be noted that it was December and we didn't have heat again. This guy's just jittering around the house in his tidy whities sweating like a sprinkler. So C went into his room and he's cursing and slamming things around in there. J goes to the bathroom and I hear C tearing out and then J comes running into the room and slams the door, looking absolutely terrified. He throws a chain lock on the door and tells me we gotta move the beds and dresser against it. He said that C had a sword. Well, it was a machete, and that thing comes blade first through the shitty door. So we're frantically trying to move our mattresses against the door and the dresser. We have no way outside besides the window, but we're gonna have to go quietly as hell under his window and run through the woods into the dark to get to the nearest payphone in order to call the cops. Luckily C is still going at the door and making a ton of noise, so we were able to get past his window and to the payphone. The cops were able to get to the house easily because the front door was still unlocked for the hookers to come in. He was arrested fairly easily and he was tiny and there weren't many cops there. C had several outstanding warrants, so he ended up getting locked up for a long time. J was and is a complete piece of shit unrelated to this story and after this happened, Social services thought that maybe this was not the best housing arrangement for me, and I moved to a different location. I never heard anything else about C after that, as a lot of even worse things happened, and this event was put into the past, and for some reason, it popped into my head again. It might not be perfect, but I hope it entertained anyone who heard it anyway. And yes, this is very real. I've lived a very odd life so far. So my family is Italian and I've spent a lot of my life in Italy. I feel comfortable there, though I've always known that it can be very unsafe for a woman traveling alone. However, I don't really look or seem like a tourist, so I usually feel pretty confident that I won't be a target. This naive thinking led me to a scary situation. I was living and working in a smaller city while on a gap year, and I had made some college-aged friends who were also from out of the country. We'd been spending most of our evening going to bars, eating good food, all the fun things you can do as a young person in Italy. One night, one of my friends and I were hitting a bar when a group of men asked to buy us drinks. There were four or five of them, all seemed to be Italian and a little older than us. Being new to the city, we felt flattered and excited by the attention from some attractive local men. They bought us drinks and we walked with them to a nearby piazza. Most of the guys seemed normal, maybe a bit pervy, but nothing to raise alarms. There was one guy, though, that didn't talk at all. One of the other guys told me that the quiet guy wanted to kiss me and I should go home with him. I laughed it off and refused. Italian men are known for being misogynistic and forward, so it wasn't surprising. They kept flirting with us and asked us to go back and smoke something with them, but we declined. 1am rolls around and my friend and I decide it's time to go back to our apartments. We say goodbye and start heading home. Unfortunately, we live in different parts of the city, so after a minute or two, we split ways. My friend lives close by, but I live 30 minutes away, outside of the city walls. We're both kind of drunk and we're small women, so we tell each other to stay safe. I begin my long walk home, when after about 15 minutes, I start to feel weird. I get a strange sensation and I decide to call my long-distance boyfriend just to have someone on the phone with me. I'm chatting with him, listening to him talk about his day, when I suddenly get a bad feeling. I turn around and standing behind me, about 50 feet away, is the quiet guy from the bar. He's followed me for almost 20 minutes, walking just behind me after I left the piazza. I'm on a long cobblestone road in the middle of the night and there's no one else. 
It's just me and him and my boyfriend on the phone. I instantly go into panic mode as this guy starts to walk up to me. I tell my boyfriend on the phone that I'm being followed and to stay on the line. The guy gets closer to me and I'm almost frozen with fear. I don't want to run because the long road leads even further out of the city. In a dark strip of abandoned parkland and a stretch of interstate. This man reaches me and has an awful, ugly smile on his face. He's taller than I am probably late 20s and is clearly on some sort of drug. He tells me that I need to come with him and he grabs me by the arm. My boyfriend is on the phone and I narrate everything that's happening, but this guy clearly doesn't speak English. He also doesn't speak Italian very well, but he's insisting in a thick, strange accent that I come with him. He has me tightly around the arm and pulls me in to give me a disgusting, sweaty kiss. He smells like vomit. I have no idea how I formulated this plan, but I'm so proud of what I did next. I told this man that I'm engaged, and that I'm a good American girl, and that I won't go with him, but I will meet him tomorrow at 12 o'clock, in the piazza, and he can take me on a date. He asks for my Instagram and I give it to him, panicked as I watch him type my name into his phone. Then, he lets go of his grip and turns around. He's happy with the plans we made. I watch him for a few seconds to make sure he's not going to change his mind and turn back to me. Then I start to run down the road, faster than I've run before. I get to my apartment and lock myself in. I open Instagram to immediately block this guy's account. My poor boyfriend is so freaked out because there was nothing he could do. So I didn't see this guy again. I was extremely shaken up and ended up moving apartments so I could be within the city walls. When I told my landlord this story to explain why I was moving, she told me something even more chilling. A year ago, on that exact same long road leading out of the city, an American girl had been jumped by two men, dragged behind a retaining wall off the interstate, and brutally assaulted. The men were apparently part of a prolific Albanian gang that had a stronghold in the city and were also engaged in human trafficking. Remembering the man's strange accent, I am convinced he was part of that same gang. I don't want to think of what could have happened had I not gotten so lucky. I think this man just decided I wasn't worth it. That beautiful Italian city I was living in lost its glamour once I experienced its terrifying underbelly. So I'm a Pokemon Go player. I was a mild fan of the franchise as a kid, and now, in my mid-twenties, I find that it allows me to get out of the house more often and do something that doesn't involve, well, my house. If you've played the game, you know that there are these places called gymnasiums, where you can place one of your Pokemon to earn you a max of 50 in-game coins per 24 hours. These coins can buy important in-game items, as well as cosmetic items and as you may have guessed, it's quite the popular feature in the game. However, since I live in a huge European city, there are many, many players to compete with in order to secure a spot at these gyms. The reason I'm telling you all of this is to let you know why in the world I would brave the cold winter of my metropolitan city at 3am. You see, it's not just that I'm stupid, it's also because I know most folk are asleep which in turn allows me to quickly defeat all the Pokemon in the gym, and then place my own. I've been doing this for a few months, and I've been quite successful. So, tonight the routine was the same. I got dressed, put on my coat, my scarf, and my black leather gloves. I went out and made my way to the first of three gyms in my area that I usually conquer in the game. It's actually quite fascinating to observe the people that wander in the city at these hours. Well, tonight, I was going to meet a special guy. I arrive at my first gym, which is in a smallish street that curves to the right for quite a stretch. I empty it and place my own Pokemon inside. Afterwards, I linger around the area, taking off a glove to scratch my head, but overall, just managing the game and looking things up. Some cars go by 
And that's when I see him. This guy, clearly over 180 centimeters, making his way down the street. Now these are just my country standards, but everything about him screamed, thug, ready to knife you. He was sporting a black cap at night, concealing his face with a shadow. He had on a black jacket with dirty blue jeans and rip-off Timberland boots. My immediate reaction was to keep it cool and neutral, and just calmly place my cell phone back into my pocket. As he went past me, he gave me this, what the fuck are you looking at look. I couldn't help but give back a small sideways glance as I put my glove back on my hand. I started walking towards the next gym, which happened to be in the same direction he was walking, and he, to my surprise, started speeding up. Then he pulled out his cell phone and tried phoning someone. This immediately reminded me of my girlfriend, as this is a common tactic she uses when she feels like she's being followed by strangers. Whoever he tried to phone did not pick up, however. He looks back at me, keeps walking, increasingly faster. He switches sides and starts walking in the middle of the road, effectively distancing himself further and allowing the parked cars to get between me and him. And then, abruptly, he stops. He turns around and asks, Hey friend, you know how I can find transport at this hour? I'm feeling awkward and freaking out at the same time, so without even looking at him, I just said, At this hour, only Uber. He starts walking only when I pass him. Then it hit me from my perspective. He was a thug-looking guy that could very well have tried to rob me and potentially harm me. But from his perspective, I'm a 171 centimeter guy in his mid-twenties that for some reason decided to pocket his phone at that moment he passed me and gave him a sideways, what the fuck are you looking at, glance as he put on a black leather glove and started following him with not a single person awake around, looking like a hitman or a serial killer. As anxious as I was, he must have been terrified enough to try to phone someone and then initiate dialogue with a total stranger at 3am, just to be sure that I wasn't a psycho about to knife him. We walked together in the same direction for almost 10 minutes after that, without looking or talking to one another, just two awkward guys who did not want to meet each other ever again. So, thug guy, I won't follow you like a serial killer, and you won't meet me ever again. This happened to me during the end of 2015 and the beginning of 2016 until I moved due to the fear of living alone in my apartment. For a bit of backstory, I'm a 22-year-old British female. I'd been living in Japan since April 2015. The apartment I first lived in was rented out by a company connected to my school. It was not a good apartment at all, but at the time I didn't know what the general quality and size versus price of Japanese apartments were. I was given one of five that I chose before I moved in. The apartment was seriously tiny. It was one room. The kitchen was connected and the bed was about two steps away from it. The length of my whole apartment was about ten steps, but I was excited because it was my first time living alone and it was in a country I'd only previously dreamt about living in. After about a month of living and studying in Japan, I met my ex-boyfriend. He told me that the area I lived in was not a good one and it was known for inhabiting creepy people. He warned me not to walk alone at night anymore, or if I did, then I shouldn't wear headphones and to be very wary. Now that's done, I'll get into the story. I'd been living there for six months when my best friend returned to England and moved out. This left me a bit scared because I had noticed previously that the neighbor on my left was a bit odd. He would constantly clear his throat as if he was coughing up a fucking hairball or something. He didn't live immediately next to me, but down the hall. So when I exited my room and looked left, his door was in my view. On the left were stone stairs going up to nothing, and if you went past the stairs, you'd be standing outside his door. And on the left is more hallway and stairs going down. I only took these stairs to do my washing, otherwise I always used the stairs on my right at the end of the hall, because the stairs leading to the washing machines were always full of spiders. 
fuck that. So my friend moved out, and after that, I noticed this guy a lot more. At this point I'd never seen his face, but I knew when he was in or out of his place in the evenings, due to the light that would yellow his people if it was on. He still cleared his throat all the time, and despite having space between us, it was loud enough to sound like it was coming from outside my door. That's how loud he did it. To be fair, our walls were crazy thin. I didn't think much of him until I started noticing that when I went outside my door to smoke, his light would suddenly turn off. I didn't think too deeply about it since I would usually go out at night. Maybe he just decided to go to bed and I coincidentally saw it. Every time. Anyway, one day I went out for a cigarette and saw his peephole go black. I stared at it while I smoked, trying to pick up on any changes in the light to confirm or disprove my theory that he hadn't turned off the light and that it was in fact blacked out by his own face. I was stood up this time for some reason. I usually sat down, but I had a weird feeling this day and stayed standing. I forgot to mention that our doors are metal, so opening them and closing them make really loud noises. I stubbed out my cigarette and put it in my ashtray when I noticed him open his door and start coming out. I was on high alert, so I was a bit panicked, but I thought to myself, he's probably just taking out his trash or something. Then I went cold as I noticed he wasn't holding anything at all. He just stood there, facing me. I turned as slowly and naturally as possible to go into my apartment as he started walking. He went past the hall to the stairs and towards my apartment. The path was straight, so if he intended on walking past me, he'd have to keep his feet straight, but he didn't. His walk was angled towards me, and the space between our doors was less than three meters. I opened my door, and he suddenly started to walk much faster. I got round my door and entered, closing it, and just had enough time to see him lurch towards my door as I slammed it shut and locked it. He stopped outside. I couldn't see him because of my broken peephole. I didn't hear him keep going past my door or going back to his, so I knew he was right there, right on the other side. As I was listening intently, I saw my handle very slightly jiggle. He was trying to open my door with fuck knows what intentions. I waited for maybe 30 seconds before I heard him finally turn back and walk back to his place, and then I heard a door shut. I was extremely panicked at this point, so I called my male school friend and explained everything. He asked if I wanted him to come over, but he lived pretty far from me and it was already late. I told him I'd be okay, and he stayed on the phone with me for a while as I calmed down. During our conversation, he asked me to open my door and close it to see if the guy would come out again. I did, opening and closing it hard, listening intently and to no surprise, I heard his door open and close again after he probably paused and stared, wondering why he'd heard my door but not seen me. After this, I was so scared to be in my apartment at night or go out for cigarettes. I started testing it. I'd leave my room silently, smoke, then close my door normally after I was done and listen. Sure enough, every time I closed mine, I'd hear his door open. I would occasionally hear him come to my door and just stand there. One night I was out smoking and the creep came home as I was there. I froze still, staring at him from the corner of my eye. He didn't even open his door at first. He just stood there, staring at it for way longer than normal. Another thing that I cannot 100% say was him, but I am pretty sure it was, is that sometimes I would smoke in the stairwell when it was raining because the rain would hit me when I stood outside my door. I smoked and put my cigarette in my ashtray. It was kind of smelly, so I left it there on the stairwell. I always left it on the third step, the same one I habitually sat on when I smoked there. I left it there tucked in the corner by the wall and went inside. I closed my door normally and went to bed. I knew the people that lived on my right, one to three doors down. We all used the second stairwell when we went out and I know for a fact that they don't smoke. On the left of my creepy neighbor's room was a Chinese couple that I didn't know. They, and the creep, always used the stairs that led down to the washing machines. The stairs I was sat on, as I said before, 
are not used because they go up to nothing and they aren't even visible unless you walk around the corner. Anyway, I go back the next morning to get my ashtray and not only was it a couple of steps up and in the middle, there was a cigarette butt and a scrunched up packet of cigarettes, the same brand that I smoke. I don't know if it was him, but that stairwell is only easily visible to us. This was all happening over the months of 2015 and the beginning of 2016. The thing that convinced me to finally move out was the following. I'd been out for dinner with my boyfriend and we got back after 11pm. To enter the gate at my apartment after 11pm, you need a key as they lock it. I was walking faster than my boyfriend, turned a corner leading to my apartment, and saw a figure stood in the darkness near the gate, waiting and watching me approach. He started to appear from the shadows, away from the apartment and toward me. My boyfriend turned the corner, and as soon as this guy noticed him, he pulled his phone out and quite clearly pretended to talk to someone on it. My boyfriend and I walked past and he slowly followed. I didn't realize at this point that it was my creepy neighbor, but we were silent, both wary of the situation. As I got to the gate, I noticed that it was locked and started searching my bag for my keys. The guy came up, said excuse me, and nonchalantly opened the gate and stood on the other side. I'd found my keys by this point and he was holding his ready to lock the gate again. But the guy was stood as if he was waiting to see if my boyfriend would enter with me or not. I showed him my keys, said thank you, and that I locked the gate. He reluctantly left me before my boyfriend had come in, and we watched him go up the stairs, but we didn't see which apartment he went to. When I saw I'd used the washing machine stairs, it clicked that it was my creepy neighbor, and I told my boyfriend. We went up the same stairs slowly. I went first and peered around the corner to where my neighbor lived. He was stood there, waiting, staring at his door but not opening it. He noticed me come around and turned to me, staring at me until he saw my boyfriend, and then he went inside abruptly. This was the last incident I could handle. I knew he was up to something no good and I didn't want to wait for anything else to happen, so I decided after that to cancel my contract and move out. Until the day I moved, he still did creepy things. I'd hear him outside my door, or see the black people, and I knew he was staring at me. Let me start this off by letting you know that I was living close to a metropolitan area for a little over a year before moving back to my tiny hometown. Before that, I was at college, other places, and stuff like that. I didn't interact with anyone from my hometown besides family for many years. I even deactivated my Facebook for a few years. Anyway, fast forward to fall of 2020. I moved into a house in this tiny town. One chilly fall night, I decided it was the perfect night to chill and get inebriated off many glasses of wine. I was relaxing on the couch with my girlfriend when we suddenly heard someone knock on the front door. It was around midnight, so she immediately told me not to answer the door. I immediately got up to pull up the blinds on the glass portion of the door to see a meek-looking girl, probably younger than 20, standing on her porch with a blanket in a bag. I was shook by this because in a town like this, there are no homeless people. The town is so small, people usually have a support network when things go sour. I asked her what was going on, and she said she was homeless and needed a place to stay. My drunk self thought it was an amazing time to fulfill my need of helping the world by opening my front door to let her stay in the guest room. My girlfriend immediately sat her down and was asking her questions, but looking back, her answers were pretty vague. Eventually, she told us she knocked on every door down the street to find a place to stay, because she got into a fight with her mom, so she wasn't homeless. It is also odd to think a young girl would do that, considering the danger. Eventually I find out that she went to the same private school that I went to, from first to sixth grade, except the college extension of the same campus. 
we were kind of bounding on shit-talking the campus because it's this new age bullshit school run by boomers. But then she mentioned that she had a no contact order for sitting at the same table as someone at the school. My drunk self did not register, no contact meant restraining order. So we're talking and then she says that she recognizes me from Facebook. I was alarmed, especially because I've never seen this girl before in my life. We have an almost 10 year age gap. She told me it was because I posted a local rental on the Facebook home share. Okay, that's reasonable. Small town. But then she tells me that she knows my mom. This is alarming because my mom and I have different last names, and she doesn't have any social media or any way to connect us. That was another thing my drunk self registered only the next morning. Fast forward to the morning. She says she's going to leave, and I ask her if she wants a ride because it's cold out. As I drive down the street several miles, I realize she does live on the same street, but she also would have to pass at least five developments and many rows of houses to get to my house. Was I really the only one to answer the door, or did she target my house? The next day, my girlfriend and I both discussed how odd that was and how many things didn't add up. Later in the day, we come back home from the store and we see the girl in front of our house again. I'm panicking because I'm horrible with confrontation, and my girlfriend said, you let her into the house, you deal with it. My girlfriend stays in the car, and I ask the girl what's going on. She asks again if she can stay with us. I panicked and asked my girlfriend to get out of the car. My girlfriend told her that she didn't know if she had a gun or who she was, that she could only stay with us if she opened up to us about everything and why she's not going home. We sat her down in the kitchen and nicely grilled her, only to get vague answers. To be honest, initially I was concerned it was an abuse situation, but it turns out it wasn't. At this point, she's in our house, and we don't know how to get her out. By a stroke of luck, she says she's leaving to go to the dining hall and will come back later. We quickly tapped signs on both the front and the back door that read, Landlord won't allow additional tenants. Best to go back to your mom's. It's later in the evening and dark out at this point, and we hear banging on the front door, then we hear banging on the side door, and then the back. Finally it stops. We were upstairs and we knew it was her, so we just waited it out an hour. I walked downstairs to check because we were starving and we wanted to use the kitchen. I decided to take one finger and slide one blind shade up from another to peek through the kitchen glass doors. She's standing there, facing me, in the pitch black on my back deck. She was there the entire hour. I looked her dead in the eye and then turned around and went upstairs. Time passed and she eventually left. When I opened the door, we noticed she took the handwritten notes. As the next day rolls by, Everybody's mom and cousin is lecturing and laughing at me about opening my door to a stranger, which, to be honest, I would never normally do. But the whole thing wasn't sitting well with me, and I needed more information. I posted something on Facebook about it, and a boy I went to elementary with messaged me, asking if it was Christine, because she had an obsession with him that led to a restraining order. He advised me that she's probably harmless and not to respond to her. She hasn't come back since. I still have no clue why she truly showed up or how she knew me. It cost me the purchase of a ring security system, but it could have been worse. This happened around three years ago when I was in my first year of university. I was living with two other roommates. I was walking home from the station only 15 minutes from our house, and it was only 9pm. It wasn't too late, but the area was pretty suburban and didn't have a lot of street light. There were a couple of people that came out of the station with me, but as I walked, I noticed it was only one guy who was jogging. I didn't think anything of it, as I was used to walking that road but then he starts acting kind of weird. Like instead of crossing the road on the stoplights, he would just jump the rails even though there were cars passing and he would change his pace a lot. 
This whole time he was in front of me, so I was kind of keeping an eye already. Then he stopped by a bench to tie his shoelaces, so I ended up walking past him. All of a sudden he runs up behind me, hits me in the head and takes my hat. He continues jogging and I guess I was so shocked, I just stood there frozen. Then all of a sudden he turns around and starts jogging towards me again, so I ran for it into my nearest gas station. I told the guy behind the counter and he offered to get me an Uber home. I of course told my roommate so we could be more careful and vigilant. Then, not even a week later, I was walking home and noticed another man looking at me and following me in the same area. So I ran for the gas station again. But before calling an Uber, I saw the man waiting outside. Underneath his hood, it was the same guy. I called an Uber but had it take me to my school instead in case he found out where I lived. I was way too paranoid. It got me and my roommates to get the hell out of that house. A few months later, I found out from a friend that there was actually a series of murders happening in that same time and area for Asian girls. It shook me because I'm Asian. This was many years back when I was still a young teen and around 14 years old. I remember being done with homework and playing on the Nintendo 64 in the living room. I lived in a small apartment which was technically a refurbished basement of the building. The front door started the living room where the TV is located. The TV faced inwards so that meant I would be facing the door at all times whenever playing games. Anyway, when the front door moved, I noticed immediately. I muted the TV and crept towards the door, positioning myself right in front of it. The door started inching itself open, as if someone tried to push it open slowly. After a few seconds, I slammed the door and locked it. I heard a small rustling noise and some jingling sounds. It sounded like either a dog shaking itself dry with some chains hitting each other, or a person shaking a bag full of keys. I was ready to push back with all my 14-year-old mind. Luckily, whoever was at the other end of the door stomped upstairs and out the apartment main entrance. I don't know who that was or what they wanted, but I'm glad they didn't try to break in again. I feel quite lucky that nothing else came out of that, but it's still unnerving to think about it. I live in a small town in Denmark with a population of roughly 3,000 people where nothing ever really happens and the following scared the entire town to death. Back in 2005, or when I was still in kindergarten, a strange and agitated man who was a father to one of the children came and demanded my teacher that he wanted to see his daughter and take her out of school. My teacher could see in his eyes that something was not right and that he was extremely upset. He therefore denied him to see his daughter, and after a very uncomfortable discussion, the father eventually gave up. He walked to his car without looking back and drove home. My teacher grew very worried and decided to call the local police to go check on the family's house. Later that day, it was reported on the news that the father had murdered his own wife with a gun, and after that, he ended himself. At the time, my best friend lived next door to the family, and he has since told me that he could hear the mother screaming in a very horrifying way, followed by three shots, and then a grown man crying his heart out. Ten seconds of silence, and then finally, one more shot. It creeps me out just to think about this, and I feel so sorry for the daughter who was left an orphan at such an early stage in life. I really don't know what would have happened to the daughter if my teacher had not stopped the man taking her home with him. I hope you're having a decent life wherever you are, girl. This happened when I was three to four years old. It's probably my second childhood memory and the most vivid to this day. Anyway. We lived in a ground floor apartment suite that faced the front of the building property, right beside the entrance. 
In this area there was grass and trees and enough space for kids to run around and play. I was standing looking out the patio window and I saw a little boy and two girls playing out front. Suddenly this big burly man with a shaggy long beard runs up and grabs the two girls. The boy is kicking and screaming, telling the man to let them go and also calling for his mom. The man got the boy away from him and took off with the two girls. The boy ran back into the apartment. For years I brought this up to my parents, hoping they could give me some context or remember anything that happened. They'd basically tell me I'd probably dreamt it and it's not real. Last year I mentioned it to my mother and she says, Oh yeah, they were siblings and that was their dad. He and the mother were going through a lengthy custody battle and he tried to kidnap the twin girls. She actually said she never wanted to admit I actually saw what I saw as to not scare me. Okay mom, I've spent my entire life having this memory, knowing it was real and being told it was not. So thanks for the validation I guess. The girls were returned to their mother and I assume the father probably lost custody. This happened a year ago, but I still think about it. Me and my friends had the munchies and wanted to go to Taco Bell at 2am, so we took my mom's car and went on our journey. On our way home though, my friends took a wrong turn and ended up in a cul-de-sac. As we were turning around, a resident on the street gets into his truck and starts pulling out right in front of our car. Us, thinking he's going out somewhere, waits for him to go, but he just sits there for a second before getting out and coming toward the driver's side. He walks up to my friend driving and starts yelling at her to slow down, that she's going too fast down the street, this and that, and then he started banging on my friend's window and tried opening the door. I can see him doing this, so I tell my friend to drive because I don't want to be sitting there anymore. She pulls the fuck off and he jumps in his car behind us. Halfway out of the street, I noticed he was following us. I stuck my entire upper half out the window and yelled at him. At this point he's chasing us while I'm giving my friends directions back to my house. All of our phones are dead or at 1%. He ends up in front of us and cornered us in another cul-de-sac up the street. My friend is driving in people's lawns to get away. Eventually he followed us all the way to my home. My friends ran inside to tell my mom. I run straight for the car yelling at him. He asked me what I yelled out of the car and I said to his face, You fucking baby ass bitch. He gets upset and almost gets out of the car when he sees my mom come out of the house. He tries leaving, so I stood behind his truck, shouting out his license plate numbers. She makes it to him and his entire demeanor changes, acting like he's the innocent one, like he was scared. I was told to go inside and my mom obviously gives him some words of wisdom. She tells me he followed us home because someone ran over his dog a while back because they were speeding through his street but it still gives no excuse to follow teenage girls home. Everyone knows what doing laundry is like. Monotonous work while your brain tries to waste away the minutes it takes for the machine to finish its cycle. Occasionally, having stiff conversations in passing with strangers. This night was no different at first. As I pulled my laundry out of the dryer and began to fold it on the table, I heard a voice over the lull of my headphones. Excuse me, are you using this? The voice came from a man in his late 40s to early 50s. He wore glasses that reminded me of my grandfather. He was wearing a stained disposable face mask. It hung under his nose and just above his mouth. I could see the start of a dirty blonde mustache poking out. He was gesturing to an empty cart next to the table. I simply said, No, I'm good. I have one already. And he took it and began loading his laundry and folding it on the table adjacent from mine. Now started the usual routine questions that all lonely older men seem to ask. What's your name? Amy. Ah, uh, that's beautiful. So how old are you? 22. Do you live around here? Not really. The town over. I lied. Did you go to college? What did you study? Yes, culinary arts management. Oh, 
So you like to cook? He asked. Yeah, I responded. I tried to keep the conversation short but lighthearted. As it continued with some short remarks about the wonders of doing laundry, he asked the dreaded questions. Where do you work? Do you live by yourself? I hesitated on the questions momentarily, trying to keep my privacy intact without provocation. Oh, you wouldn't know it. It's a small mom and pop restaurant. And no, I don't live on my own. I lied to him. He stopped folding his laundry as I started to load mine into my hamper. He walked over to my table and leaned against the washer so that he was in my eyesight. His eyes squinted slightly as he pulled his mask under his chin, uncovering his face. He then awkwardly called out, So do you want to go to the movies with me sometime, cutie? His eyebrows knitted together softly as a wave of different emotions flooded my brain. Confusion as to why he'd even ask. I didn't even know his name. Embarrassment as he's easily my father's age and I'm not into that. Shock because this man doesn't even know what my face looks like. Anxiety because I have to reject him. I was so thankful for my mask because I'm sure my expression was not one he would have liked to see. I softly shook my head and he copied my actions in tandem. I fumbled out a soft, no, I'm sorry, I have a boyfriend. I studied his face as I watched his brain process my response. He knitted his eyebrows together and curled his lips. I could see nicotine stains on his teeth. He replied in an eerily soft tone, kind of like how you calm a fussy baby. Oh, no, you don't want to go see the movies. You have a boyfriend. Okay. He nodded his head with the last word. His eyes widened slightly as they fixated on mine. His voice suddenly grew cold. It's okay. You don't have to lie to me. It's okay. You don't have to lie to me enunciating both don'ts with tinges of anger. Annoyance filled me at his accusation. I'm not lying. We've been together for a year and a half. I love him. His eyes softened as if he just now realized the other two people in the laundromat. He slinked away, returning to his laundry long abandoned. I looked at him as I pulled my hamper into my arms, and I uttered a small, have a nice day. I haven't been back to that specific laundromat, and I don't do laundry alone anymore. I was leaving the gym the other afternoon, and I was awkwardly exiting behind a middle-aged man. He was pretty well dressed to be exiting a gym. He held the door open for me but then he began keeping pace with me when I headed toward the direction my car was parked in. He began talking to me, just politely at first, and I realized he had a strong accent. It was kind of European. He quickly changed the conversation from normal small talk to asking me if I was single. I quickly said no and tried to speed up. He kept pace with me. He seemed a little upset by this and moved closer to my side as we walked through the parking lot. Would you leave him for me? You're beautiful. I could take good care of you. I know I made a face because he grinned, like he knew I was uncomfortable, and he was excited by it. I'm in a happy relationship, I deadpanned. Seeing that my car was just four more space down, I considered running for it. There was no one else in the parking lot but us. Would you give me your number? He had already started taking out his phone. I'll text you so you'll have mine, in case you change your mind. No thank you, I quickly said. If you'll excuse me. I sped up again, and thankfully he stopped at the car one space before where I was parked. I half jogged to my car, risking a glance back toward him. He was watching me intently. My gut told me he was waiting to figure out which car was mine. As I unlocked the door, I saw him start to speed walk toward me. Sped up by fear, I jumped into my car and immediately locked the doors. I quickly turned my key and threw my car into reverse as he reached my door. Without even checking what was behind me, I hit the gas and pulled out of the space. 
I saw him pull his phone back out and seemingly take a picture as I accelerated by him. I was shaking with fear as I pulled out of the parking lot. I had no pepper spray and no weapon on me. I don't know what he would have done if he'd had reached me before I could lock my car. I'm afraid he got a picture of my license plate or something. Was it a trafficking attempt or just a creep? Either way, I won't be going back to that gym. In December 2018, my ex and I split up after seven years in a relationship. I was new to the dating game, so I didn't want to just jump back into it. In February, I met a guy at a bar we regular. The second time I met him, we exchanged numbers. By the end of March, I was feeling pretty comfortable with him and invited him to a party at my house. He stayed after the party and one thing led to another. Well, after it was all said and done, I had a weird vibe. He was too pushy and it made me uncomfortable, so I asked him to leave. I planned to never speak to him again. That is until he started to text me from random numbers. He would say things like, Hope you have fun fishing, when I didn't post anything on social media that I was fishing. He also said, I hope the movie was good, when I hadn't posted anything online that I was at the movies. He would text me and ask me where in the bar I was at at different bars when I hadn't told anyone or posted where I was going. We had no mutual friends, so he was following me. The final straw was when my friends took me to Washington, D.C. for my 25th birthday celebration. We bar hopped all over the city. Around 2.30 a.m., we came out of the last bar we were at and decided to get cookies across the street. As we were coming out of the cookie shop, guess who pops up? You guessed it, he does. He mentions a few bars and said he wanted to say hi earlier, but being as I hadn't replied to his messages, he didn't want to freak me out. I was terrified. My friend's husband thankfully stepped in and called him out. He threatened to call the police on him. I changed my number and moved. Thankfully, I haven't heard from him since. When I was around six or seven, I had my own room on the other end of the house than my parents. I was a very anxious child with an active imagination. We lived in an old family farmhouse a couple of miles outside of the town my father grew up in. His family lived near us, all within a couple of miles. My aunt had lived in the farmhouse before we did, before I was born, but she moved out after her and her husband divorced. One night, I woke up and saw a man standing in the corner of my room. I ran to my mom and dad's room, screaming. My parents rushed in, and upon seeing nothing, assumed I had a bad dream. I got to sleep with them for the rest of that night. The next night, I woke up and saw the man standing outside my window. Again, I ran to my parents, and again, they saw nothing. This occurred for about two weeks, every single night. Sometimes a man would be in my room, sometimes he'd be right outside. My parents never believed he was real. Until one night when I awoke to the man standing above me. He was blocking my path to get out of my room, to even get off of my own bed. I was terrified and we stared at each other for a long time in silence, before he walked out of my room, straight out of my bedroom door. I finally gained enough courage to race out of my room and wake my parents. By this point, they were tired of the sleepless nights caused by the overactive imagination of their child. I think my dad walked to my room just to comfort me, saying, No one is in your room, honey. It was all just a dream. Except it wasn't. The large muddy boot prints that stained the floor was proof of the man. Eventually, my dad found out my aunt's ex-husband had been released from the psychiatric hospital where he was being treated, and he returned home. He still had a key to the laundry door. My aunt failed to tell us that she did not change the locks. My aunt's ex-husband suffered PTSD from being a prisoner of war while in Vietnam. He self-medicated and fried his brain. 
though we never knew for sure why he did it, he was found deceased soon after in a riverbed. I don't think he meant me any harm. So I was doing some shopping and was making sure I looked good doing it with my fresh cut and winter clothes fresh pressed. I'd been to a few stores already in a shopping strip when I noticed a girl with a camera was at the exit, waiting for me. I'd seen her already in a store I was previously in. When I passed by her, she acted really weird. She turned her camera away from me. The obvious, take a photo and not look like you did a thing. So I faked her out. I went to go inside one store, then doubled back out the second she stepped in right behind me. But when I started turning around, she bumped into me and straight sniffed me. Immediate what the fuck spurted out. I walked out, staring her down. She had a really creepy, horny smile and just bit her fist. Oh my god, what the fuck. I got out of there and went straight to my car, which was in a parking structure. I told security about the girl and she was apprehended. I was flagged to park because the security officer confiscated her camera. Cops were there in a minute since it is a shopping strip. There were tons of photos of me. I didn't press charges, but I demanded all the photos were deleted. She did it all while I fucking me. Today I learned how fucking creepy people can be. I'm a woman and I was leaving my friend's apartment around 10pm to go back to my car. It was parked on the street around the corner. I had my 12 pound dog with me and we were walking toward the car. I typically will switch side of the streets I'm walking on to avoid people that look questionable. The life of being a woman since we always have to be on the alert for that kind of stuff. I'm walking up the empty sidewalk to my car and a questionable looking man starts crossing the street. He's walking towards me. There was no reason for him to be crossing the street that I could tell. I had a really bad feeling and decided to turn around and go back to my friend's apartment. As I turn around, I notice he has stepped up the pace and is following me. I call my friend and start yelling, Come downstairs and let me in. There's a guy following me. You have to be let into our apartment lobby by a resident. Me and my dog are sprinting down the street and I keep looking behind me. He starts running behind me to catch up. He's gaining on me and I'm in a full run. My dog is confused but is trying so hard to move her little legs. Luckily my friend was down there waiting for me and let me in. We ran in, shut the door, and the guy just walks by as I get the door shut. He starts walking casually like nothing happened and continues on his way. I wait for 30 minutes, shaking and my heart racing. After I calm down, my friend walked with me to my car this time. I drove her back to her apartment. I have no idea what might have happened, but I've never been so scared for my life. I know this can happen to guys too, but it is sad how every time I'm walking alone, I am constantly on the lookout for being taken, killed, or assaulted. Always trust your instincts, even if nothing happens. It's better to be safe than sorry. This just happened this week. I was on vacation with my family and they were driving me insane after three days. I decided maybe I'll take a look on Bumble and see if there are any cute locals to meet up with for an hour or two. My family would be checking out some museums, which is not at all my interest. My friends at home also thought it would be a funny story to meet up with a local. For reference, I'm a 25-year-old woman. I was with my parents and younger sister for a week. We were in a remote-ish area in a small town out west. We were visiting a lot of national parks, so there weren't a lot of people nearby on the apps. I started swiping and soon came across a guy who was my age and looked cute. He had similar interests to me, so I felt like I'd be down for a meetup with him. We started talking on the app and then eventually moved to Snapchat. He suggested we go to the next town over to see fireworks. 
I couldn't that night since I had plans with my family. I was also hesitant about meeting a guy 30 minutes away when I was already put out of my element, and we were in what felt like the middle of nowhere. He knew I was there to do hiking in parks, so he suggested we go for a local hike nearby the next day. For an important side note, I deleted my last name on Snapchat before he added me, so he doesn't know it. I don't know if I had a bad feeling in the back of my mind or what, but I didn't want him knowing much of my information. However, it did show his last name, which is important for later. I had hesitations about going into the woods with a random guy, especially since I'd been around the hiking trails the day before. My cell service was cutting in and out, but the trails were populated and I did want to see more out there. My family was going to go to a museum that day that I had no interest in, so I agreed to meet him the next day. That night, I got a bad feeling. I kept getting nervous about meeting a random bumbleman far from home and in an area I don't know too well. Even though my family knew where I would be, I was feeling uncomfortable and decided maybe I should just google this guy and see what other information I can find out about him. Things like his Instagram or LinkedIn. I wanted to give my family his information while I was gone in case anything happened. I also wanted to verify what I knew about him, like his workplace and alma mater, that kind of thing. Well, I type in his first and last name and the town we're in in Google, and I click on the first link. The next thing I know, I'm looking at a registered sex offender profile. His full name, address, photo, description of his offenses, and it was fairly recent. I'm not sure if I can go into detail about his offenses, but I can assure you that had I not googled this man, things could have turned out very, very badly for me. Or maybe not, but nonetheless, I'm shook that I almost met up with a registered sex offender. Please make sure to do your due diligence when meeting people off of the internet. I thought a lot about sharing this experience, and I finally decided to tell it. When I was about four, I went to the pharmacy with my mom. Now keep in mind that the area where the store was located was a middle-class, peaceful neighborhood. So, as my mother was buying what she needed, an old man entered the store. He was probably in his late 60s or early 70s. I remember that when I was waiting for my mom to finish shopping, I started doing some ballet moves. When the man saw me, he complimented my ballet moves, and he told me he has a niece at home who also takes ballet classes. I remember the man asking if I wanted to go meet his niece and play with her. As the naive child that I was, I said yes. The man told me to follow him. As we almost reach the exit of the store, my mom calls my name. I go to her, leaving the old man behind. I did not realize that it was a dangerous situation until I was older. I asked my mom why she didn't react earlier when she saw the man taking me with him. My mom tells me that she was going to save me, but she wanted to see if I would follow the man. Looking back at this, I realize how lucky I am for my mom and how vicious the incident was. So my mother went to the grocery store yesterday. She was looking over a young woman's shoulder to look in the frozen food freezer. The woman kept looking at my mom like she was trying to remember something. She turned around and told my mom, You look just like my best friend Catherine's mom. She asks my mom what her name is and she says, Carrie. The other woman says, Yes, my friend's mom is named Carrie. Then the other woman asked my mom if she worked at the hospital because she remembered seeing her. My mom said yes, that she was a medical coder. The young woman nodded and said that Carrie knew she was a coder from the hospital. My mother didn't recognize this woman, but thought that she knew me or had seen her at the hospital. However, when my mom asked where this Carrie worked, it was a completely different hospital in a different part of the state. So this other 
Carrie looks like my mom, has the same career as my mom, has the same name, and has the same daughter as my mom. Talk about coincidence. I was in a toxic, borderline abusive friendship with a girl from the ages of 9 to 12. Here's some background information to give you a little understanding as to what my life was like back in the late 2000s to early 2010s. I grew up in a very tumultuous household. My parents hated each other, and my extended family, along with my immediate, were plagued by mental illness and drug addiction. So, needless to say, I was a very anxious child who was drawn to unstable people, and suffice it to say, they were drawn to me. I was a shy 11-year-old girl who, like many others before me, used the internet as a way to vent my frustrations and anger about my home life. This was the time where AOL was the main source of communication used between friends, and I was no stranger to this along with MySpace and Facebook. However, I wasn't like the typical preteens of this era, or so I thought. I kept my profiles private, never accepted a follow or a friend request that I didn't know, and never shared my location on these said profiles. This is the part where I introduce Tanya. Tanya and I met in elementary school, one of the points in my life where my family situation was quite volatile, and in retrospect, I think she sensed this. I was vulnerable, and Tanya took advantage of my innocence. She never really displayed any signs of her true intentions in the beginning, as they never usually do. She would do shady things every now and again, things like manipulate me into begging my mom to stay on the computer until the wee hours of the morning just so we could go on not safe for work websites. She ghosted me when I didn't give her my favorite pen, or she'd yell at me when I couldn't perfect a guitar solo on Guitar Hero. She did some things to me that I believe my brain blocked out due to trauma. My mom didn't like her either. Parents have a weird intuition when it comes to friends, and I wish to God I would have listened to my mom before Tanya did what she did to me. Tanya's behavior changed for the worse when we turned 11. Tanya was openly jealous of my success in high school. Granted, she was incredibly smart herself, but she always made it a point to mock me for having great grades and would comment that since I was not pretty enough, having good grades would be a nice balance. Nice, right? It took me a while to build my self-esteem up after all those snide remarks she would make about my weight and face. And only now as a 22-year-old do I think that I'm beautiful and have a wonderful figure. Anyway, back to Tanya. As a result of her jealousy and growing resentment toward me, she began to plot my downfall. I make no exaggeration either. This girl literally tried to ruin my self-worth, even more than she already had. It started in sixth grade. Tanya and I were remarkably close that year, and I wanted to do everything with her. We would talk all day in school, and we would chat all night on AIM. On one particular evening, Tanya and I were talking about boys. Being that we were hormonal young girls, our conversations would usually turn onto who we liked in the school that day. Being that I had a horrible relationship with my father, I didn't really trust boys, even from an early age. So it was rare if I developed a crush on one. I remember Tanya and I's conversation going something like this. Do you like Mark? Tanya asked. The kid in my class? Yeah, why? I replied. I heard he likes you, she said to me. What? No way. Totally. He told me. Do you want me to talk to him and give him your username? She asked me. Yes, of course. Oh my god. Thank you, Tanya. I replied to her. My heart was racing. A boy liked me impossible. When Tanya told me that she would give Mark my username for AIM, I nearly exploded in my seat. Eleven-year-old me could not believe I was going to have my first real boyfriend. Oh, how wrong I was. Fast forward to the next night. I was getting ready for bed when I heard the famous AOL ding sound off my iPod touch. You know the sound I'm talking about. When I checked the notification, 
It was a message from Marky Boy 99 I turned red. Tanya had really talked to Mark and gave him my username. She was truly the best. He messaged me with the usual, hey, emphasis on the three whys. I responded, hey, I didn't want to come off as desperate, so I only used one why. Not even one minute later, he messaged me back. We talked all night, about everything, or days, how school was, what type of silly bands we liked, typical 11-year-old stuff. I have to admit, I was smitten right off the bat. I think it was partly because I'd never really had a boy like me before, and the other part being that my self-esteem was so low that I never thought a boy would be capable of liking me. It could also have been because Mark was one of the more popular boys in school at the time. He played football, was mouthy to the teachers, and extremely outgoing. All the things a young girl would be attracted to. We talked for months, my puppy love growing for him more and more every time we chatted. Of course, I never spoke to him on the phone, nor did I get his number, because why would you do that, right? All the time I was speaking to him, Tanya would be gassing me up, telling me how proud she was of me, and that I deserved a boyfriend. My suspicions of Mark only began to grow when I attempted to approach him during school hours. Again, I had anxiety, so I never really spoke to Mark outside of A. When I went to talk to him, Mark looked confused, as if he's never had a conversation with me before in his life. He turned away from me on the playground and walked to be with his other friends. Huh. Weird. This wasn't like him. He was usually so chatty with me online that I expected him to welcome me with open arms in person. My ego was bruised. My little 11-year-old mind tried to rationalize this behavior by chalking it up to him not wanting to talk to the nerd since he was so popular and that he just preferred to keep our relationship online. I told Tanya the news and she seemed to be genuinely heartbroken for me. She was just as angry as I was and vowed to confront Mark later that day during music class. I was happy. Tanya had my back, and as far as I knew, she was going to tell Mark off about being a total jerk to me. Well, it worked. Later that night, I get a message from Mark telling me how sorry he was for ignoring me, and that he was just going through some family things. So back in love I was. I didn't care that Mark ignored me during school, I didn't care that he rejected my advances in person. As long as I had him to talk to online and Tanya's support, I was fine. I even told my mom about him and she was extremely happy for me as well. Another month passed and it was March 31st, 2011. Mark messaged me. He told me that he had something very important to tell me the next day. The anxiety began. What was it? What did he have to tell me? At that point, I considered myself and Mark to be dating, so I was anxious that he was either going to break it off with me or that he was going to make us public in school the next day. I told my mom and Tanya, almost on the verge of tears with how excited and nervous I was. Well, the next day, April 1st, 2011 rolled around, and this is what followed. It was around 7pm and I was on Club Penguin as I usually was, until I heard a familiar ding. It was Mark. It was time for the news I'd been waiting for all day. Hey babe, he messaged me. Oh my god, hey, I've been waiting for you to chat to me all night, I replied. Sorry babe, I was at practice. Are you ready for the news? I was shaking with anticipation at this point. Even writing this now, a whole swell of emotions are resurfacing. Yes, of course, I replied. It was then that Mark sent me a picture. I opened it, but only it wasn't Mark. It was Tanya, and she was holding a handwritten sign that said, Happy April Fool's Day. At first I started laughing, and I mean, it was an ugly laugh. Of course, it was a prank. Tanya had gotten me so good, right? Well, no, not at all. It was then when the realization hit me that I started to sob. I felt betrayed and like a loser. Tanya had been behind Mark all along, 
and she'd been planning this whole big joke since October of 2010. She had been so jealous that she'd pretended to be someone else and string along my emotions when she knew I was already in a rough place mentally. She told me that I was stupid to even think Mark would even like me in the first place and that I was dumb for not asking for his number. Tanya had been at this for six months. An 11-year-old girl plotted Mark, used him to make me think a boy liked me, and tricked me into believing that I had a boyfriend, all the while telling me when we hung out that she was happy for me and that Mark and I were a cute couple. I told my mom, who then called her mom. My mother was livid, to say the least. She told Tanya's mom to tell her daughter never to speak to me again. I was crushed. My best friend of three years had catfished me because she simply wanted to play a joke. I was loyal to her and she toyed with my emotions because she could. Tanya had tried multiple times to guilt trip me into being her friend again in the months that followed leading into seventh grade. One of the more memorable and honestly messed up times being when she messaged me a few days after my birthday in August to tell me that her mother had just died in a horrible car crash that her body was dismembered and they could only find her head and a wedding ring. As anyone would be, I was in tears. Tanya's mother was nothing but lovely to me and learning that she died in such a violent way crushed my soul. I started talking to Tanya again, asking her when her mother's funeral would be. Tanya then revealed to me, seconds later after speaking to her about the grisly details over her mother's passing, that she was kidding and was pranking me again that I was so stupid to believe her. She even sent me a video of her laughing. I was disgusted. Who would even say something like that? What 12-year-old would message someone that their mother was dismembered in a car crash? She then revealed her ugly and quite frankly evil intentions when we were at the beginning of 7th grade, and she became friends with a girl named Kaylee. They would both invite me to sit at their lunch table. And because I was desperate for friends, I stupidly accepted, only to be met with hordes of insults and laughter behind my back every chance I wasn't looking. Tanya then messaged me one night, telling me to end it all, and that the world would be a much better place without me in it. She had Kaylee tell me to go jump off of a bridge. Tanya told me that she hated me, and was never really my friend to begin with, that I deserved all the pain she put me through the year prior. I again told my mom, who then called the police. She had had enough of Tanya, and so had I. For four years, I had to put up with Tanya's malicious behavior, and I just couldn't handle it anymore. My mom made me delete my AIM account, and Tanya's mom told her never to contact me again, or else. My mom also advised me to move lunch tables, but I was hell-bent on not letting Tanya win. For the entirety of seventh grade, I sat at the same table as Tanya, only I spoke to my friends at the other side of the table. I never spoke to her, looked at her, or gave her any sort of attention. Kaylee was scared to death of me afterward too, as the police had gotten in contact with her family as well. It's been 10 years and I still haven't spoken to Tanya. I'm 22 now, have two bachelor's degrees, one being in psychology and the other in history. I'm now working towards my master's in clinical social work. Tanya did other things to me too that I could write a whole other story about, but I think writing this one helped give me closure on the part of my childhood that scarred me for years. I thank God for my mom stepping in when she did. I don't know where I'd be without her. As for Tanya, I don't know where she is or what she's doing, and I would rather not know. On the off chance that she stumbles upon this story, I have a message for her. Your jealousy and wishes for death upon me did not win. I truly hope that karma does not come around one day to bite you in the ass. All this happened during my junior year of high school in New Mexico. It was 2006 to 2007. My older brother had graduated the previous year and was still living with us as I started my junior year. My mom had met a man at some point and during the first few months of my junior year, she eloped with him. 
While she was eloping to her dream beach wedding in Texas, my brother assaulted me. I was tinkering with a dead computer tower. He comes downstairs to see this and starts beating me. I get away and run upstairs, with him trailing me. He pulled on my shirt and ripped it while I was trying to get away from him. Somehow I did, and I barricaded myself in my room. I called my boyfriend at the time, who lived four hours away. He was immediately ready with guns and friends and on the road. I called my mom to tell her what happened and that I was leaving. I still had a few hours to wait though, and I was terrified. I started calling friends to see who I could hang out with until my boyfriend arrived. I found a friend to help me for those few hours. I don't remember how I got out of that house, nor do I remember the rest of the night. This started as a trend of me missing a lot of school and spending a lot of time with my boyfriend, avoiding my brother, and eventually my stepdad, Jim. A lot of the time between the assault from my brother and the next big event is really blurry. I don't remember a lot and come to find out from my therapist later in life. This is because I apparently disassociate and didn't even know it. It's an additional defense mechanism to fight, flight, or freeze. My brain is good at blocking out trauma. I don't remember much before the age of 13 and I've come to terms not knowing why. Anyway, I digress. I do recall one piece of information though. My mom spent weeks tracking down a shotgun that Jim sold out of desperation. It was a family heirloom or something. She tracked it down, bought it at a pawn shop, and gave it to him for Christmas of 2006. He cried when he opened it. He also ended up putting it up against my mom's head, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Sometime in the spring semester, I was at my boyfriend's house, four hours away, when I get a call from my mom. She says that she knows I'm heading home soon, but not to come home because she's staying at a hotel. She explains that Jim assaulted her in front of his family, threw his phone at her head, and held the shotgun to her head. He was arrested at the house, but his parents who witnessed the whole thing bailed him out, so my mom went into hiding. I get to the hotel in a nearby town. This is where my mom explains further that the assaults have been happening for a while, it always happened when I was at my boyfriend's and that she hid it. She also told me that Jim's sister stayed in the hotel with her for a day or two. I'm not sure why. My mom and I planned to stay there for a bit. I can't remember how long. We told nobody where we were or what was going on. This was my mom's idea. My grades were suffering. Counselors had no idea what was happening with us. I now realize how fucking stupid this was. One night in the hotel, we're hanging out on our respective beds, watching TV when the room phone between us rings. My mom mutes the TV and we watch it ring, glancing at each other. We don't answer. Instead, we let it finish and my mom calls the front desk. The room was quiet. I could hear the whole conversation and I will never forget it. Hello, how can I help you? Did I just get a phone call? Yes, you did. Was it from a man? Yes. Did he have a Texan accent? Yes. Mom, visibly shaken now. Where did the call come from? Another room in the hotel. My mom paused before saying, Call the police. Call the police? Yes, please call the police. I don't remember exactly what happened after the phone call but I do remember hiding between the two beds on the floor with our old cat. We were on the first floor with our cars right outside the window. My mom said that this was to keep an eye on them, but I now think this was a dumb idea. She had no idea if he still had the shotgun or not, so we were just hoping he did not know where we were. After what felt like forever, the police knocked on the door. The knock was so startling, but so relieving when they announced that they were the cops. He was arrested at the hotel, and we proceeded to find out a lot of things. He was trying to find us. He hunted for us. The hotel had an internal balcony, so the second floor could look down and see the first. He was apparently just above us a room over. He was calling the front desk, complaining about our cat. He wanted to see what room the front desk would go to. Apparently, he was also texting my mom during the whole thing, 
He was saying how dumb we were for leaving our cars outside, how he knew where we were, how he'd hunt us down and kill the mother lion and her cub. Demented shit. He even said some of this in the voicemails that my mom never let me listen to. We left this hotel for another, further from our home. We couldn't sleep, and around 3 a.m., I left to go back to the safety of my boyfriend. Eventually, I came back to my hometown, but I still didn't go home. This time we were staying with a family friend. Legal things were starting, and I went with my mom at one point, in case they needed my statement. But in the end, they didn't. While we were staying with this family friend, my paternal grandmother passed away from a heart attack. To say the least, my junior year was the most stressful year. After some time, my mom went back to Jim. He assaulted her multiple more times and even tried to kill our cats. Eventually she moved away from him, but was technically married to him from 2006 to 2014. Right now I'm happy as fuck. I have a regular therapist a supportive partner, and his family who loves me unconditionally. The trauma that I live with is a daily battle, but I'm in such a great place now. I no longer have contact with my mother, and it's the best decision I've ever made. She later married another abusive man once her paperwork was done with Jim. I couldn't let her traumatize me further. I was 10 years old when I met my best friend. We were pretty much inseparable. All through high school, we were always by each other's sides. Our last names both start with J's, so we had almost every class together. He was a very smart kid, an A student. As we grew up and became adults, we had different views on what we wanted to do with our lives. He had his first child at 18 years old, and then he split up with the child's mom. The thought of college never set well with him. He worked a 9-to-5 job trying to support himself. By 21, he'd met another woman and had a baby with her. This time he was doing good. He stayed with the woman, taking care of his and her other child. I was proud of him. Then all of a sudden something inside him flipped like it was a switch. He left the other woman, moved to another state. I hadn't spoken to him in about two months after that. All of a sudden late at night, I get a phone call from his mother saying that he was in jail. I asked what had happened. She told me he assaulted a 15-year-old girl. He got caught and was sent to jail. He was serving two years behind bars only because there were texts from this girl saying she was 18 years old. Two and a half years later, he gets out of jail. I told him he can stay with me until he gets on his feet. He chose not to. He stayed with my mom for about a month. Every day I check up on him. The same old, hey man, how's it going? How are you? The answer I always got was, I'm good, thanks for helping me out. And then my mom called me and said he wanted to kill himself and he had a knife in his room. I drive down there to talk to him and take the knife away. Later that night, I called him and checked up on him. No answer. I called my mom and she answered. She said to me he was in his room. I told her to go look, but he was nowhere to be found. We did find out where he went that night. He'd walked to his ex-girlfriend's house and apparently spied on her and her boyfriend. He walked behind the house and ripped his shirt off. He shoved it in the crack of the window, caught the shirt alight, and walked away. He attempted to kill his child, ex-girlfriend, and an unknown man. Luckily, the adults were awake in the house. They smelled the fire and got the children out safely. They then called the fire department. My best friend admitted to this, and he's been in jail since. No matter how much you know someone, you never truly know them. When we met, we entered elementary school, and we quickly became friends. My friend was always weird, but who am I to object if I am too? She had never given me any reason to think that she would do something like this. And although I don't mean to defend her, her mother was an abusive woman, 
and an abusive mother. I had a past with psychological problems and the mother, seeing that her daughter was just as ill as me, came looking for me and found me on the street. She yelled at me to get away from her daughter and that I caused all the problems in her family. She threatened to report me if I approached my friend, and she left. Don't judge me. I was a scared girl. I let her manipulate me as she kept hitting and yelling at her daughter every day. And meanwhile, I kept away. A couple of years later, we got in contact again. We were teenagers. We returned to the beautiful friendship we'd had before, and we were very close. She told me that they were doing family therapy and that her mother treated her better. I was happy for her. Time passed and one day, the fateful day, she appeared late in class. Her hair dyed black and she smiled when I told her I didn't recognize her. That day I did not walk her home because she had things to do. I woke up the next day to my mother calling me, almost screaming. In the news, there was a photo of my friend's apartment door. The headline above read, Local Mother Murdered. And now, almost two years later, she's in a psychological clinic and I receive a letter from time to time. But no, I don't reply to any of them. At 19, I was briefly staying at a friend's house. We used to be really close and I moved, so at this point, we weren't exactly best friends anymore. She had started dating a guy we went to high school with. He lived with her and her family, and she'd completely taken with him. They did everything together. I was happy for her, until one night I woke up, feeling something wet on my mouth. And he's like a foot away, saying, silly kitten noises. Like the cat had come up and put its nose against my mouth, which didn't seem too weird at that point because, well, cats. The next night I slept in her brother's room who was out of town. I woke up to her boyfriend running his hand up my thigh. He's just crouching next to the bed in the dark. I pretend that I'm not awake but I roll over so he thinks I'm about to wake up and he scurries out. Highly uncomfortable staying there any longer. I leave and go to a guy friend's house who plays D&D with them regularly. One night after a few beers, I confide in him why I don't feel safe at my friend's house anymore. I don't want to tell her because I'm afraid. Basically, he confronts the guy because he's heard similar stories from another girl. The guy acts like he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, and my friend tells everyone I made it all up and that all I want is attention. I wrote her a long-winded message about how they deserve each other, and I haven't spoken a damn word since. So to my ex-best friend forever and your creepy ass dude, let's not meet again, you bitch. When I was 11, my grandma had a work friend who always gave me a weird vibe. He would show up to my house right after my grandma and him would get off of work. Now, he lived in a different city than me, so he would have to make two trips to go home. When he showed up, he would watch my grandma sleep for like five minutes before waking her up. The reason I would let him in is because my grandma half asleep would just say, let him in, then she would fall asleep again. My grandma would leave the bathroom door open when she changed out of her uniform because I would be in my room when she got home or on the couch watching TV. So sometimes my grandma's friend would come in and go to the bathroom. He was weird. The main event happened when I had family out of state coming to my hometown. They were staying at my Aunt Linda's house. My Aunt Candace, who is from out of state, wanted to go fish with my grandma. I was home alone because they left early in the morning and I didn't feel like getting up to fish, mainly because I hate fishing. So at about 12.30, my grandma's friend shows up and doesn't leave when my grandma's car is gone. So then, I think he's just being weird and he'll leave. I was sitting on the couch watching TV when I then hear a loud bang. I live next to a highway, so I thought nothing of it. But then it happened again. I see my dogs run to the laundry room, which leads to the basement and back door. I go outside to see what's happening and I see the back door that's supposed to be nailed shut, 
wide open. Being a child, I start to run to the front yard. Then I see my grandma's friend is not in his car. I then call my cousin, and she and her kid come over. They jump out of their car and run to the backyard. Now it's important to note, my cousin, who is an adult, also worked with my grandma. So when she goes to the backyard, she sees him just casually walking out of my house. She says, George, why are you here? He looked startled to see her, and then he says, Oh, I had to use the bathroom. That made no sense because of the other excuses he used. Then my cousin followed my grandma's friend to his car. We looked at what he did. He took off the nails that nailed the door shut. Then he busted the bottom panel to the second door. I assume that was the first loud bang I heard. Then he went upstairs to go to the laundry room door. He tried to bust it down, so I think that was the second loud bang. When he was leaving, he was either giving up or going to his car to get something to make it easier. So, I called my grandma. She went to my Aunt Linda's house, which is where I went after he broke in. She stopped being friends and never spoke to him again. Here are a couple of my theories. Number one, he heard I had family from out of state, so he must have thought I was with my grandma and no one would be home. Number two, he broke in to try to steal pills from my grandma. Number three, because of the other weird things he did, like watching my grandmother sleep, I think he was trying to steal her used bra and panties. That's my story. I hope you enjoyed it and stay safe. Also, stop being friends with someone if your kid says they watch you sleep. So this happened to me a few months ago. I'm a sophomore in college and I was traveling down to my hometown over break. I was having some relationship issues with my stepmom, so I didn't want to stay at my dad's the night I arrived at my hometown. I phoned a friend of mine from high school to see if I could stay at his place. I knew from social media that he was still in town and I've stayed at his place before. I knew there would be a place for me to stay if they could allow it. My friend, Z, seemed like a pretty normal guy. We weren't best friends or anything, but we got pretty close by the time we graduated. We would occasionally text or hang out if I was in town. We would catch up and reminisce on the times we spent in orchestra or in English class. When I called, he seemed extremely enthusiastic. Z is normally an upbeat guy, but this time it seemed like he was getting a brand new car. I didn't think about it at the time, and he said I could sleep in the guest room. So I headed over. When I got to his house, he was just as excited as he was on the phone. He was bringing up stuff to do, like getting high and watching weird movies or playing video games. Z's parents weren't home, so he really wanted the opportunity to smoke. I was pretty tired from the drive, but since we rarely saw each other, I thought a bit of bonding couldn't hurt. We played Smash Brothers, smoked some weed, and just chatted for a few hours. It was longer than I wanted, but I was having fun, so... Whatever, right? By the time it was getting late, at around 2am, he started asking some pretty weird questions. Like if I ever wondered what it was like to kill someone, or if I thought anyone would miss me if I was gone. This, along with some pretty normal questions, like if I had a boyfriend, or how my parents are doing, or if I'm making any friends at school, gave me a weird feeling. I was confused in the moment, but it didn't hit me until after that Z could be assessing me for something bad. The weirdness of it all just made me want to go to bed. We stopped the game and both went into the basement where his room and the guest room were. We say goodnight. I go to my room and get ready for bed. I'm having trouble sleeping, just insomnia that I've had for a while, so I stay awake for around an hour until I hear some movement outside my room. The walls are pretty thin, so I could hear footsteps walking past my door, then up the stairs to the main floor, and then back down quickly after. What struck me as odd was that I didn't hear the basement door open, which it creaks when it does. The light didn't turn on, so I was confused what Z was doing. I heard him go back into his room, but I had this odd feeling. Just, ever since I met him this night, he seemed a lot different than he's ever been. 
I decided to look him up on social media and Google to see anything out of the ordinary. Everything seemed normal. Until I found his Tumblr. It was linked from his inactive Twitter account that I found on my Twitter contact list. His Tumblr was, well, disturbing. There were graphic drawings of mutilated bodies of humans and animals. Links to suspicious looking websites that I didn't dare to click on. Text posts and stories about murdering, cannibalism, and torture. There were photos of guns, knives, and axes, which after looking closely, were taken in his bedroom. The last post, around a week prior, was a text post from the account saying he wished he could find someone easy to kill, like a homeless person. I was immediately filled with dread. I knew he was going to do something. He must have gone up the stairs to lock the door. I packed my things. Luckily, I packed lightly. I opened the small window at the top of my bedroom wall. I started desperately climbing through, and as I was pulling my legs through, he opened the door. It was dark, but the streetlight illuminated enough for me to see he was carrying something long and skinny. It was probably a knife. He didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I just turned around, hopped in my car, and drove as fast as I could to my dad's house. I immediately blocked him everywhere and reported his Tumblr account, not before telling the police. They said they couldn't do anything as the guns were registered under his dad, and he actually hasn't done anything yet. Nevertheless, I told my other high school friends not to hang out with Z. Ever since, I've been creeped out whenever I meet new people. Just the realization that someone I knew so well could underneath be this person who could hurt me so bad. Who could kill me. I don't know what you're doing now, Z. I'm not sure I want to know, but I hope you're getting help. Anyways, let's not meet again. This story happened almost 10 years ago. I got home from work one day and logged into Facebook to find a message from someone I didn't know. It was too long ago to remember verbatim what was said, but it was along the lines of, Hey Rick, I know you have no idea who I am, but I've been trying to decide what to do for a few days. I figured I had to let you know what's been going on. Someone has been catfishing me using your identity for over two years and I just found out about it last week. The sender of the email was clearly pretty shaken up, and understandably was experiencing a mix of emotions. According to her, she'd met the imposter online a little over two years prior to recording this, and that they'd been engaged in a pretty intimate, long-distance relationship for the majority of that time. The imposter had created a Facebook, and had over time reposted almost all of my photos with their own captions to them, that included a good amount of art I'd drawn that they took credit for. They created fake profiles for a good amount of my close family and friends so they could comment on photos of themselves to make the profile seem legit. The funniest part to me is that although most things in my real life seemed to be mirrored in this fake profile, I was instead portrayed as trans. I think the main reason for this was that the sender of the email and the imposter would actually speak on the phone and the imposter turned out to be female in the end, and therefore needed a reason to justify her more feminine sounding voice. The sender of the email was justifiably both angry and creeped out, and wanted to find the catfish. She started asking me a lot of questions about my life, but phrasing them like, Is your sister's name Liz? Did you go to Westfield High School? Some of them were clearly information that anyone could glean from a quick glance at my profile, but then she asked, Is your best friend Rob? Which struck me as odd, since despite this person actually being my closest friend, and who I spend the most time with, we have barely any Facebook photos together, and most are from a long time ago. Then she asked, Were you adopted? And are your half-siblings Chris and Phoebe? Which sealed the deal for me, since I knew for a fact I'd never posted about being adopted online. The sender of the email already had an idea that this person had known me in real life, but this confirmed it for me. 
The sender of the email had contacted me shortly after confronting the imposter for the first time. I guess after two years, they'd finally become suspicious of the fact that the imposter would not show their face. I have no idea how it took them this long to figure out that they were being played, but I'm glad they finally decided to give the ultimatum of, show your face or I'm cutting you off. I'm pretty sure this is the point where the imposter admitted to being a catfish, and that she'd been using the identity of someone she had a crush on in high school before hanging up. I was given the URL so I could look through the profile myself, which was up for about two days after I saw it, before it was all removed. It was definitely really bizarre. The imposter had posted more than I ever had on Facebook, and it genuinely seemed like they'd lived a pretty involved double life online as me. Almost everyone I'd post photos with on my real profile would then have their own fake profiles created that had enough content to be genuinely convincing so they could be tagged in and validate these new photos. Some of these profiles seemed to have gone and made their own, real friends as well. I wondered if any of those were used to facilitate even more online dating deception. Either way, the amount of time that this person had spent fabricating their alter ego's online presence was pretty shocking. The whole time I'd been crawling down this Facebook rabbit hole, the sender of the email was looking through my real profile. After a while, she sent me a message saying, Did you take these photographs? And showed me what I remember as black and white photos of a barn or something. I hadn't, which was weird since everything else on the fake profile originated with me and she'd noticed the discrepancy. We both tried reverse image searching with no luck. Then, either through a stroke of genius or somewhat suspiciously, she thought to flip the fake number the imposter had written into the fake Facebook profile around in reverse. A Google search came up with a landline number that belonged to the home address of a girl that I'd gone to high school with. Real me was Facebook friends with the real imposter's profile, so we both went snooping around and found the photo that she'd claimed I'd taken, which pretty much confirmed to me that this was the imposter. I'm pretty sure there were more indicators to the sender as well, but I can't remember. I thought about messaging her for a while, but decided that it probably wouldn't lead to any good. At the time, my thoughts were definitely, let's not meet. I talked a few times with the sender of the email, just to try and decompress a bit, but honestly just wanted to distance myself from the situation. I also had my suspicions about the sender as well. I figured maybe it was the imposter's one last ditch effort to try to talk to me. Although when it was all over, the sender seemed to be eager to leave this all behind as well. So maybe not. Either way, it was a really strange experience. I felt mostly freaked out and violated. But I guess there was a small part of me that was flattered by it. I had a lot of mixed emotions. The weirdest part to me is that I'm a really approachable person and would have definitely been willing to talk and probably be friends if this person had just approached me instead. Although I'm still not sure if this was done out of an obsession for me or if this person felt like I was just a suitable image to base this fabricated persona off of. I remember talking to her probably twice throughout high school and I really didn't have a very good idea of who she was other than a quiet hipster girl. If any person involved reads this... I'd definitely be happy to talk now. It's been years, but I've gone from being very put off to always wondering why this person chose me over a myriad of other more attractive, more interesting people online to base their other life off of. According to the sender who contacted me, she'd probably spent more time online pretending to be me than she actually did going about her own life. I have a tumultuous history of addiction and have had plenty of my own escapes. Which is why it's always fascinating to me that someone would want to pretend to live someone else's life as a means of doing that. Because at the end of the day, the person pretending to be me had no idea that I spent my time daydreaming of being a different person as well. I guess it just goes to show that no matter how much you wish you were someone else, chances are that person has plenty of their own reasons to want to escape their own demons. Thanks for listening.
So when I was in college, I used to pull all-nighters. I fueled myself with takeout and coffee during the exam week, like any other students would. It was early January, so the area around my apartment was pretty deserted, as most people hadn't returned from their winter break yet. But unfortunately, I still had an exam left. It was around 2am that night. My flatmate and I decided to order some food, but our usual restaurant wasn't accepting orders online. So we decided to head out and grab some cup noodles and soda from a nearby 24-7 store. Anyway, as we walked by, most of the usual night stores were shut, and even the 24-7 store was closed for some maintenance issue. I was disheartened, but still very hungry. I opened my phone to see if there was anything else nearby. I was busy browsing my phone for any place it might be open, and my friend started messing around saying that she saw something move inside one of the stores and that maybe it was following us. I brushed her off as usual as I knew she had a bit of a habit of trying to spook me. However, as we started to head back home, my friend suddenly huddled close to me and told me to call someone. Me being the hungry and dense idiot that I am, thought that she meant to call up a restaurant, so I told her in an annoyed tone that I was trying, damn it. We reached a T-point intersection on the main road, when my friend suggested that we take the inner lane as the streetlights on the main road are out, and it is pretty dark there. I quickly agreed, as the inner lane is pretty well lit, and we do know our way around. As we walked into the lane, my friend, who'd been acting strangely up until now, started to tuck my elbow, and before I could question her, she looked me in the eye with a somewhat scared smile, and she said that we needed to run. She then started to run, full-on sprinting. Now, usually I ignore her antics when she tries these practical jokes on me, but for some reason that night, I too began to run, because something in my gut told me to listen to her. However, after a while, I was cold and out of breath. I yelled at her, Can you just fucking stop? There's nobody about, so stop messing around. She slowed her pace and turned around, and by now, I was more annoyed at her for trying to spook me. Mind you, by this point, there was a few feet of gap between us, and as I caught my breath and turned up to look at her, I could see her expression had paled all of a sudden. She wasn't looking at me, she was looking behind me. It was at this point my sleep-deprived cranky brain realized that there was something seriously wrong. I heard a noise behind me. What I didn't know was that our stalker who had been steadily following us, was only a couple of feet behind me, and when I had yelled at her, he had heard me and started to run towards us. I still can't completely describe that moment. The sound of someone's weird laughter and footfall behind you, the sound of your own pounding heart, the way your ears go hot and tingly. It was my body being aware of just a lot at once, so when I semi-turned back and saw a random-ass full-grown man sprinting his way towards me, I didn't know how to react. I'd like to think that I could have unfrozen myself, but it wasn't until my friend forcefully grabbed me by the arm and started pulling me that I began to run. I heard him yell and roar behind us, but I couldn't understand what he was trying to say. And at this point, I was busy running and too scared to turn around. I think it was the adrenaline in my veins and my friend's grip on my arm that helped me not lose my shit and run the fastest I ever have in my life. We zigzagged our way through the lanes to lose him, and we finally managed to get to our block. The last time my friend turned to check, he'd begun to slow down in his pursuit when we crossed the barricade to our area. When we entered our apartment building, I crumpled down by the elevator floor, still trying to process the entire chase, and to figure out why this man had decided to chase us. My friend then told me she'd seen him looking strangely at us when we were around the convenience store. He was near a truck unloading some boxes. She dismissed him, assuming he was part of the store maintenance crew, but something about him made her feel uneasy. Later on, when we were at the tea point, she said she saw him again with his truck following behind. She felt that it could be a coincidence, but she decided it was still better to take the inner lane where the truck couldn't go in. When she finally saw him for the third time by the corner of the lane, silently walking his way towards us, she knew that he was following for real, 
and we had to shake him off. She always used to jokingly quote to me, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, but thrice is enemy action. I still think it couldn't be more true in this case. Even though a lot of my friends later told me we could have taken him on, as he was only one person while we were two, at the time we didn't want to take chances in the event he had friends waiting around. To this day, I thank the fact that I trusted my gut to run, even though I was unaware of the exact nature of the danger behind me initially, and I'm also thankful that my friend ran back to drag my dumbass, even when she could have easily outrun him. It's been three years since then. Even now, my brain automatically tries to scan who's around me, and it also tries to mark out possible exits of any room. This happened nearly a decade ago now, but unfortunately, the memory remains very ingrained in my mind. For a bit of context to get started, I live in a medium-sized city that, in 2011, was badly affected by a strong earthquake. Around 200 were killed, and a large portion of the city's older buildings were either outright destroyed or deemed uninhabitable. One such building was the affectionately coined Mental Rehabilitation Center, Sunnyside. Naturally, having a significant number of mentally ill patients without a roof over their head only exacerbated the city's problems at this stage, and short-term solutions were desperately in need. From my understanding, hospitals with the necessary facilities took the bulk of the load, while other temporary hospices and homestays were forced to become somewhat more of a permanent fixture even if they lacked the security that previously would have been a necessity to house these patients. I would later come to learn that one of these temporary hospices was less than a block from my house. My house, along with the majority of the houses on my street, back onto a small creek. It runs through our suburb. It is relatively common for neighbors to wade down the creek to visit those who live a few houses along or on the other embankment. Virtually none of these properties have a back fence which prevents access. So, it's about four weeks after the initial earthquake, and things are beginning to return to some sense of normality. We are still being forced to use a communal portage on out on the road, but in general, we are on the mend. It was a Sunday night and I'd gone to bed early, because the next day was going to be my first day back at work in almost a month. At some point in the night, I began to stir, as I realized that the soft laughter I was hearing in my dreams was actually a physical, real-life laugh. The laugh was very faint, childlike almost, a giggle. Sitting up in my dreary state, I assumed my brother had left the television on in the lounge. So, dragging myself out of bed, I staggered down the hallway to switch it off. However, as I approached the living room, I soon realized that the laughter isn't increasing in volume, and upon reaching the room, I confirmed that indeed, there is no TV or radio producing any sound. Suddenly feeling a bit foolish, I make my way back towards my room, where I hear no further giggling. Passing it off as my sleep-deprived brain playing tricks on me, I get back into bed and soon fall asleep. An hour later, I was again stirred awake, this time by the soft plucking of my steel string guitar, which I kept in my office at the other end of the hall. There was no discernible melody, just random touches. Feeling very frustrated at this point for being woken up twice in one night, I immediately flung myself out of bed, determined to find the source of these irritating noises. Before I even make it two steps towards the door, the noise comes to an abrupt halt, and I realize that it too was coming from my room. More perplexed than angry at this point, I whirl around to see what possibly could be producing this noise, and all at once I feel like the wind has been knocked out of me. Sitting in the corner of my room, cross-legged, on a puddle of wet carpet, is a large, shaggy man. He was wearing soaked clothes and holding my guitar. 
A million simultaneous thoughts go through my mind at an instant. The obvious, what the fuck, who the fuck, and how the fuck were very prevalent, but also more bizarre thought processes like, God, it annoys me when people touch my guitar without asking. All logical thoughts seem to come to a complete standstill at that point, and for whatever reason, some deep-seated social cue came roaring to life and my mouth sputtered out the words, Would you like a cup of tea? Because you know, obviously the first thing you do when someone comes to your house is offer them a cup of tea, right? The man seems pleased with this interaction. He perks up and nods brightly. Finally, the rational part of my brain awakens from its coma. I turn and sprint out of the room, slamming the door shut behind me. I scream for my brother to call the police while holding onto the door handle with all my might, dreading the desperate struggle that was sure to happen. There's a man in my fucking room. He comes running and once seeing the look of terror on my face, does not waste time in making the call. While listening to him give the operator our address and pleading with him to hurry, I hear a soft knock on the other side of the door. No sugar, please. The word bamboozled comes to mind when I think about this moment. I fully expected to reach down, pinch my arm, and awaken from the most vivid dream of my life. The police arrived not long after, and my brother led them to me and the end of the hall, my knuckles turning white on the doorknob. After mentally bracing myself, I let go of the handle and leapt backwards, letting the policemen do their thing. They rushed into the room, tasers drawn, shouting at this home invader to show himself. Their aggression was short-lived, however, and I was still close enough to see why. The man was simply sitting at the edge of my bed now, amusing himself by playing with one of my figures. I think the officers were also taken aback by this, as they halted for a second before continuing, but a touch more gingerly. To cut a rather long-winded story short, and to confirm what you probably have already deduced, yes, this man was a patient at the mental hospital. He had slipped out of his temporary hospice and waded along the river looking for houses to explore. Muddy footprints on my neighbor's decks confirmed that he originally tried to enter their homes. I was simply the one foolish enough to leave his door unlocked. The police took him away, and they later gave me a follow-up call. They told me he'd been put in a much more secure location, but that I should still be a lot more vigilant when it comes to securing my house. In hindsight, I believe this man was totally harmless. Ill, yes, obviously, but not malicious. There was ample opportunity where he could have harmed me, had this been his intent, but he did not do so. He simply took my unlocked door as an invitation to come in. I did not press charges as I didn't want to damage the life of an already damaged person. The incident left me pretty shaken up for quite some time, excuse the earthquake pun. I still struggle falling asleep sometimes, but for the most part I have moved on. There is one thing that I've not been able to let go of, however. I believe this one detail has left a permanent scar on my psyche. As the police were leading the man from my house, he uttered a short giggle. The same one I heard when I was originally woken up. And he said, the man couldn't find me under his bed. When I was a kid growing up in a very small town in the 80s and 90s, my parents often left me and my little sister home alone for a few hours at a time to run errands. My mom had two brothers, and we lived in the same town as one of her brothers and his family. Being a close-knit family, my cousins and I were always at each other's houses. The adults would leave us alone a lot. Back then, it was the standard to tell kids, don't open the doors for anybody, and don't use the stove and we never thought anything about it. After my parents divorced, it happened more often as both my parents worked different shifts at their jobs. My sister and I lived in town, 
and my cousins and grandma lived outside of town with only a few neighbors nearby. So my sister and I got the best of both worlds, city kids and country kids. Because we lived in such a small community, everyone knew everyone. I think we all felt pretty safe knowing that nothing bad would ever happen. And if it did, our neighbors would help us. Around the time I was eight or nine years old, I began to get strange phone calls. It would be a man's voice on the phone, and these calls would almost always come when I was home alone. This person would tell me they could see me, that they knew I was alone, and that they were coming to get me. When I'd get these calls, I'd usually just hang up without saying anything. Of course it terrified me, but I was too scared to tell my parents. I was scared by the calls, but I also liked getting to stay home alone. Being left to take care of my sister made me feel grown. I didn't want my parents to stop leaving me in charge. Stupidly, I kept the calls to myself. One day while my dad was at work, my cousin, who was a year older than me, was at my house. We were watching TV and playing when the phone rang. She answered it, and her face went pale. She hung up and started crying. I immediately asked her what was wrong, and she shook her head saying, I can't tell you. I pressed, and she finally told me about how this man would call her a lot when she was home alone, always telling her he knew she was by herself, and that he was coming to get her. I was shocked. I explained that I'd been getting the same calls, and we immediately agreed that it had to be done by one of her older brothers, or their friends playing a mean joke on us. We calmed down and kind of laughed it off. I didn't get another call for a while after that, so I almost forgot about it. In the summer between my 6th and 7th grade year, my grandma had taken a part-time job and my mom lived in another town. So my sister and I were home alone almost every day while my dad worked. We spent our days outside playing in the yard, riding our bikes around the neighborhood, and tanning in our backyard a lot. One day my sister was over at her friend's, and my cousin was back at my house. We were listening to music and dancing around the living room when the phone rang. I picked it up, and there it was, the voice. At this point, I was 12 years old. I developed a little bit of an attitude. When the man told me he knew we were home alone, I laughed and said, Liar. He waited a moment and said, I can prove that I know you're alone. I laughed again, a little more nervously this time, and I said, Oh yeah? Then do it. His response was, I love that little yellow tank top you're wearing today. By this time, my cousin had turned off all the music and was watching me. She saw when the color drained out of my face. I was freaking out. I'd just gotten a new outfit and was wearing it. A yellow tank top and jean shorts with matching yellow and pink patches. I yelled, Leave us alone. And I slammed the phone down my heart racing. I started crying and told my cousin. It was him. He knows we're here by ourselves. I ran over to shut the living room curtains and my cousin said, I think we should call somebody. I agreed, but instead of calling the police, she picked up the phone and tried to call her mom at work. We got no answer. I called my dad's work and left a message with the gate guard to have him call me. As we were debating what to do next, I heard the gravel in our driveway crunch under the wheels of a vehicle. I ran to the window and peeked outside to see a small red car sitting in the driveway. I did not recognize the car. I did not recognize the man and woman inside of it. In our tiny town, even if I didn't know someone's name, I'd surely know their face. But I didn't know either one of them. I froze with fear as I watched them talking to each other. My cousin ran to lock the back door. We had no weapons, no real way to defend ourselves other than my softball bat, which was outside on the carport. As my cousin came back into the room, she hissed, We have to hide. My cousin hid in a small space between a tall bookshelf and the wall. I threw myself behind our recliner, which faced the window. 
I watched in horror as the woman walked up to the front door. Instead of knocking, she tried the doorknob. I tried to quiet down my breathing, convinced she might be able to hear me. I watched her shadow through the curtain as she walked around to our carport. Sure enough, I heard the doorknob jiggle. There was a pause, and then the door shook as if someone was trying to force it open. I covered my mouth and forced myself not to scream. After what felt like an eternity, the sound stopped and everything went quiet. I was too afraid to move, so I just waited. I have no idea how much time passed, but eventually we heard the car backing out of the driveway. Once I got the courage, I ran to the window to peek out again to make sure they really had left. I saw no trace of the red car, but I was still wrapped with fear. I told my cousin she could come out. We hugged each other in relief. Even though we were scared to go outside, we decided to get on our bikes and ride to the office my aunt worked in. Once we were there, we told her everything. The phone calls, how long they'd been happening, the red car, and the description of both people inside. She immediately called the police and we had to give our statements about it all. When my dad got home from work, he'd asked me why I'd call the gate guard. My aunt filled him in on everything, and from that moment on, we weren't allowed to stay by ourselves again until I was probably 16. We never heard anything else on the case, and we also never got any more phone calls again. It's been years, and I still think about the situation often. We never found out who made those calls, or who those people were in the red car. The phone calls could have just been some mean prank, and those people could have just been trying to simply rob the house or something. But the coincidence that day was crazy. I have no idea if the man kept watching us as we grew up, but the whole thing definitely made me paranoid about a lot of things. I always make sure to keep a weapon near me at all times when home alone. Now, as a single mom, I am forced to leave my kid home alone occasionally. I'm really protective with them, giving them tons of instructions and rules about what they can and can't do. They may roll their eyes at me, but I know the dangers of the world, and I'd rather be safe than sorry. This happened to me a few years ago, when me and my brother were still both living at home. There had been a rash of break-ins in my area in the weeks leading up to it. Several of my neighbors had been broken into. My mom had been at work all day. It was around 8.30 at night, the time she normally arrived back. I was in the kitchen. My brother was in the living room on an exercise machine. I heard the familiar sound of the front door opening and then closing. I assumed my mom was back. I waited in the kitchen for the door from the hall to open, or for her to call out. Neither happened. There were no further sounds. When a minute went by, I went out to check and I found no one there. There was no car in the driveway. I assumed my mom had arrived home and immediately gone back out for some reason. My brother, who also heard the sound, thought the same thing. Over the next half hour, I found myself thinking, Imagine if it turns out that it wasn't her, that an intruder had literally been meters away from me, on the other side of the hall door. Fast forward to 9pm, my mom arrives home, and of course it hadn't been her first time. All three of us collectively freaked out when we realized that while my brother and I had heard the door open and close, indicating someone entering the house, we hadn't heard them leave. A search of the house revealed that we were panicking over nothing. No one was there. Our theory is that the intruder opened the door and maybe stepped into the hallway, then heard my brother on the exercise machine and hastily noped out once they realized the house wasn't empty. We filed a police report and got a locksmith in, who told us that the front door lock that had been installed back in my grandparents' day was hilariously ineffective 
and anyone with the slightest burglary experience could waltz into the house whenever they wanted. Apparently you could almost open the thing without tools, that's how easy it was. Needless to say, we got all the exterior locks changed, bought an alarm system, and basically sealed up the place like Fort Knox. The creepiest element of this became clear only in hindsight. See, in the days immediately prior to the break-in, there had been a number of odd incidents. I thought I heard someone trying the back door handle late at night. Our dog freaked out for no apparent reason, and we had found a cigarette butt on our front doorstep. We think the house was being cased. Whoever did it might have missed me and my brother's presence, and concluded that the house's only occupant was a single woman who worked long hours. To this day, I'm glad I did not open the hall door and meet them face to face. So this happened about a year ago when I was a senior in college. It was a football game day, and after the game ended, I went to a bar with my friends for a couple of drinks. I then decided to go home. I was in bed and asleep by 10.30 because it had been a long day. Around 4.30 a.m., I woke up to a dark figure laying in bed with me. I was so disoriented that all I managed to mutter out was, What are you doing? And the guy quickly jumped over me and ran out my door, down the stairs and out the front door. I was in shock and so confused as to what had just happened. I lived with three other girls. Two of them had friends in town and just happened to lock their doors that night. And the other wasn't there. So what's really scary is that this man walked all around our house and even came all the way up the stairs to find my room. We called the cops and they came by to take our statements. Then they told us that our neighbor called them 30 minutes before us and reported that she woke up to a dark figure standing in her doorway. We were all so freaked out that five of us slept in one queen bed for the rest of the night after that. To this day, I am terrified to be home alone. I never found that guy, but I hope I never see him again. This is an actual true story. It just happened. I'm typing this out because I need to process how insane it was. So, we had a Halloween party this year. It ran pretty late and the last few people were leaving around 3am. I was chilling out front and a guy no one knew was sweeping up the cans and cigarettes everyone left outside. We live in the city so this isn't uncommon. He wasn't homeless. But he was clearly down on his luck and looking for tips. I didn't have any cash, but my roommate Mike ran inside to grab some change for him. It ended up only being literal change. I hung out and offered him a cigarette and chatted with him. He told me he was pretty much on his last chance. It's hard to get a job on parole. He's just doing whatever he can. He told me that not long ago, someone working at a pizza shop said he could sweep their sidewalk. All they gave him was a quarter and a soda for his efforts. A quarter and a fucking soda. Everyone else was gone, just me and the sidewalk guy. So I go up to bed. I'm still pretty hyped from the party, so I'm just laying in my bed on my phone for a while. About 30 minutes later, I hear a voice inside my house downstairs. Mike, you got the soda. I went downstairs immediately and saw that the door from our kitchen to our mudroom was closed. There is a door from the mudroom to outside. No one ever closes the mudroom door. It's never closed. I went upstairs to get back up, walked to the mudroom door, and said I was going to open it and that they can just leave. Eventually I got the courage to open it up. No one was there, but the door to the outside was wide open. I closed the door and locked it. I went to the front door, made sure that it was locked. When I jiggled the doorknob, I heard the sidewalk guy say, Still here, I'm just sitting outside. I don't know what would have happened had I not heard him, but the reason this freaked me out so bad 
was that he said, Mike, you got the soda. After telling me a story about a shitty person asking him to sweep and give him a quarter and a soda, when Mike had just given him a change. And also, because he was in my house. This is something that happened to my family and I in 2007 or so. I was 10 years old then. My parents' house is quite big. It has two floors and is situated in a residential neighborhood just outside of a big city. It's an upper class, very chill and incredibly boring neighborhood, but it was pretty safe. Okay, so on to the story. One night before going to bed, my dad went to check if the front door was locked but he must have been very tired that night because instead of locking it, he unlocked it. At that time, my grandma was living with us and her bedroom was the one on the ground floor. My sister and I, as well as my parents, had our bedrooms upstairs. As you walk through the front door, you step into the hallway which leads to my grandma's bedroom on the left and also the kitchen next to it. If you make a right, you walk into the living room where you can go upstairs onto the other floors. To get into the living room, you have to take a big step downward, like you'd go down the stairs, but there's only one step. So, in the middle of the night, my grandma hears a loud bang. She gets out of her bedroom and looks around to see what happened. No one else heard this. At first, she couldn't see much because the only source of light was the moonlight shining through the windows. The light switch was all the way across the living room, right next to the staircase so she had to walk through the living room to turn the lights on. For some reason, she didn't turn the lights on and decided to walk up to the couch that was in our living room because she could see there was someone laying on it, but she couldn't figure out who it was. After all, the lights were off. She thought my mom must have had an argument with my dad and she came downstairs to sleep on the couch. It wasn't my mom. It was a stranger. The loud bang she heard was this person falling off that step that led into my living room. You wouldn't expect it to be there. You just think it's flat ground, so they fell pretty bad. It just didn't cross her mind that it could be someone who broke into our home. I mean, who breaks into someone's house and decides to sleep on the couch? It's just so random. So my grandma goes up to the person, touches them gently, and asks what's going on. Why is she sleeping there and not in a room? The intruder is a woman, around 50 years of age. She mumbles some random words and my grandma realizes immediately that the woman trying to sleep on the couch wasn't my mom. She reeked of alcohol. At that point she goes upstairs to my parents' bedroom, tells them that there's a stranger sleeping on the couch in the living room. My parents freak out and my dad proceeds to take his sword off the wall. My mom was hanging onto my dad from behind as he slowly walked down the stairs with the sword in his hands. He tapped on the woman with the sword while she was still laying there, shouting at her and asking her what she's doing in our house. She was barefoot and it was winter at the time, so she walked in the snow without any shoes. At this point my dad realizes that it's just a random homeless person seeking shelter as it was very cold outside. She wasn't properly dressed for it. She was scared and begging my dad not to hurt her. My parents eventually called the police and they took her with them. I don't know what happened to her after that, if she was arrested or not, but we never saw her again. My sister and I slept through all this mess and our parents told us what happened the next morning. It was a bit unnerving to think if my grandma wouldn't have heard that loud bang, who knows what this woman would have done while we were all sleeping. When I was 13 years old, my family was robbed by my mom's ex-best friend. They, before robbing us, had broken in multiple times. One time they left the front door open, and another my mother opened the laundry room door, and as she did, the back door closed. Having these experiences, we changed the locks and made sure that we locked the doors at night 
and armed the home alarm. The following year, the events in this story happened. For a bit of context, my family lived in a really bad area. People had been robbed, and some people had even been assaulted or jumped. My father is a truck driver, so my mother, brother, and I were usually alone there. My mom is someone who really enjoys watching the ID channel on TV. In fact, my town was once featured on one of the ID channel shows. Our town has such a high crime rate that a human trafficking ring was busted, and my mom's ex-best friend knew someone that was busted. The city I live in is the most dangerous in the country, and just yesterday we drove past a car dump. Earlier in this year also, we've called the cops twice. Once because we heard someone in the backyard, and another because we heard gunshots. One night my brother was asleep in the living room. I was in my room, and my mother was in her bedroom. I was on my phone at 1am, because insomnia sucks. Suddenly I heard the doorbell being rung frantically. My mom is a light sleeper, so she got up and went to the front door. She looked through the peephole of the door. I'd walked out as she was standing on her toes looking at the front door. She was speaking to the guy behind the door. I heard a muffled guy's voice say, My car broke down and I need to use your phone. My mom cleverly replied, I'm sorry, I don't have a phone. She grabbed her phone after saying that. The man insisted and tried to open the door. He got angry because it was locked and started shouting. I went to my brother and woke him up. I told him to be quiet and we ran to the bathroom. My mom eventually joined us. We hid in the bathroom together and held onto each other. It felt like a lifetime in that bathroom. My mother was on the phone with 911 the entire time. I was making sure my brother remained quiet. When my mom was told the cops were there, she made sure that when she heard them knocking, that it was them. She gave her statement. I couldn't hear it all because my brother and I were in the bathroom together. My mom told us we could get out, and I immediately called my dad in tears. He answered, and I was crying so hard that my father couldn't understand me. I gave my mother the phone. A while later, the cops came back. They told my mother that they got the guy my mom described, and he was playing on his phone. They said he did not have a car. His intentions were probably to break in and rob us, or maybe worse. My mom watching the ID channel saved our lives. It all started over a year ago, living in my current small neighborhood. It was unusually hot in our house for October and my sister figured it'd be a good idea to keep her window open for a bit of fresh air. She was doing her homework, and I was getting ready for bed, when suddenly she bursts into my room. She frantically says that she heard some noises outside, sounds of leaves crunching under a person's steps. I believed it to be an animal, so I walked into her room and stayed there for not more than five minutes, until I heard the leaves crunching. We quickly glance out the window, only to hear the sound of something running away into the woods. But that wouldn't be the end of the story. During the winter, I enjoy exploring the woods towards the back of my house, climbing trees and traveling further back to the fields. I remember the events very clearly. It had just snowed that night, the first snowfall of winter. I was more than excited to head out there. I did so and climbed my usual tree to look out. I gave a cursory glance around me and at the ground when I noticed something strange. Footsteps leading away from my house. This wouldn't be weird as long as the front of the footsteps didn't end pointing straight at my house, and the origin of them came from a seemingly long off start. I tracked them down up to a point where there was a rusty wire fence covered in snow where they disappeared. In October 2017, it started up again. I was laying in my bed, pitch dark, not a light shining through my room when I heard it, my doorknob turning and my door creaking open. My heart stopped. Every single possibility of what it was was rushing through my mind. Since I was covered by my blanket, 
I quickly shot my sister a text. Did you just come into my room? I messaged. She replied with a sharp, no, I'm all the way in Hillard. My heart began pumping fast. I slowly snuck my hand under my pillow and grabbed my baton. I sent my dad a text and waited. My dad came in mere minutes later with a knife, shot on the lights, and I jumped out of bed. He searched the entire house with nothing. The alarm set and all the doors locked. Impossible. There's no way that happened otherwise. My mom and dad were asleep, and a cat would have opened it much faster if it jumped at the doorknob. You best believe I didn't sleep a second that night. Fast forward to December. My relatives are in town staying for a week in the basement. We turn on the alarm and all head to sleep. I stayed up gaming. In the morning at around 2.30 to 3 a.m., my uncle slowly opened his eyes with a feeling of being watched. His eyes adjusted a bit to the dark before he saw it. A guy, average height, scrawny hair flowing in the wind and shivering, looking inside their room through the window. My uncle screamed and they grabbed the baby before taking off up the stairs. That morning I was informed of what happened. I looked for footprints and saw only the smallest sign of a footprint. A front toe print made by what I can only assume was a sneaker. My uncle gave me more details without me telling him I looked for footprints. He said the guy was leaning to the left, looking in. The footprint matched his story. The left had a thin line of dirt anyone could have shimmied across. Now that leads on to tonight. The night I could swear he, or whatever it was, had been in our house. I couldn't sleep. Life has been stressful lately, and I was up pretty much all night, until I tried getting rest. Every night, I've had string Christmas lights dimly light the room, until tonight. I figured the light must have been interfering with my sleep, so I unplugged them and headed off to sleep. The pillow over my head, I started to drift off, until something happened. A quick strum of my guitar and the sound of something falling over, with a desperate attempt to stop it from hitting the ground, filled the room. The sound ignited my heart rate. Saliva, developing at an extreme speed, made it hard not to swallow. I could feel the presence of someone in my room. Realizing I'd left my baton on my desk, I did the next logical thing, pretend I was asleep. I tried and laid there for what felt like hours, when in reality, it was only a few minutes until I heard a whimper come across from my sister's room. Imagining this may be the day everyone in my family was silently murdered but me, I gathered all the courage I had. I grabbed my phone, turned on the flashlight and grabbed my baton. I busted into my sister's room and screamed, Hey! Only to see they were unharmed. My sister asked what the hell I was doing and I just stood there, looked into the pitch black of my room and cried. I've never in my life felt the overwhelming emotion of believing my family was going to be taken from me until today. I sit here in my chair writing this in the hopes to document my experiences and try to come to some logical conclusion. All I can come up with is that there's some guy stalking my family and perhaps sneaking into our rooms at night. I guess I'm gonna try to go to sleep now. This happened about six years ago when my husband and I were living in Miami Beach, Florida. We lived in an adorable little bungalow style ground level apartment with a big yard in the front with a fence surrounding it. Our apartment was located in one of the most active parts of the beach. Tons of pedestrian traffic, lots of businesses, and also some seedy characters as you will find in any city. One seemingly typical night, my husband decided to go to bed early but I decided to stay up in the living room to watch a show. Our apartment was an open floor plan, and the front door opened into the living room, directly to the left of where I was sitting on the couch. Typically, I would lock the door on the way to bed every night, but for some reason, on this night, I had already decided to lock the door. 
This decision would ultimately save me from coming face to face with an intruder. As I'm sitting there watching the show, suddenly the door starts to rattle and shake. I can tell someone is trying to force it open, pushing and heaving themselves against it. The front door was made of glass and there was a sheer blind pulled halfway down. I got up in a panic as this was the only entrance or exit to the apartment. I try to make sense of who was there. I stayed about three feet back from the door and could see from the streetlight shining behind the silhouette of a large, burly man. And halfway down the door, where the blind stopped, I could see through the glass his dirty jeans and ratty sneakers. I immediately started to panic and ran back to my bedroom where my husband was sleeping. Frightened, I shook him and begged him to get up, telling him that someone was trying to get into the apartment. When he woke up, we looked out the window and watched this man stealing multiple items from our yard. My husband started to put his pants on and said he would go out and confront him. I pleaded for him not to because I was terrified that the man was armed. We didn't call the police because I didn't want our home to be a target for retaliation. In the end, he stole several items from our yard, but he was never able to enter the apartment since I locked the door early that night. Although I loved that apartment, after that I could not move out fast enough. There was another attempted break-in a few weeks after this event when my husband was awake and I was asleep. Not long after this, we moved out, and I still wonder to this day what would have happened if my door would have been unlocked and that man had entered and found me sitting there, all alone and vulnerable. This happened a long time ago. At the time I was living alone in a first floor apartment. My girlfriend had been sick at the time and ended up in the hospital dealing with a rare disease. She recovered from it fine, but during those weeks my life was pretty much go to work, go to the hospital to be with her, come back to the house for dinner and then bed. It was a Friday night and I was alone. I decided to distract myself by reading and watching some videos on YouTube. Hours passed and it was 3am. I was in my bed with my iPad in my hand, almost falling asleep. Then I heard it. I knew that sound pretty well. You see, outside, right in front of my bedroom door, there was a long corridor that leads directly to the kitchen. This apartment was in a building built in the 50s and the kitchen door was old and it becomes slightly bent. That meant whenever you turn the doorknob to open the door, it would snap out of its place with a distinct clack sound. That was the sound I just heard. A lot of thoughts ran through my mind in that moment. Had I dreamt it in my semi-sleeping state? Or maybe the sound was real, but what happened was that the doorknob internal mechanism broke and it opened by itself. Or, of course, maybe someone was in my house and they had just opened the door. At this point my heart was racing and I started considering my options. I had a broomstick next to my bed. You may ask why I had it there. To be honest, I had it exactly because I lived alone and thought one day I might be in a situation like this where I would need a weapon. My girlfriend even used to joke about it but I guess that my paranoia was now paying off in the most unfortunate of situations. So I decided I was going to take the stick with one hand and grab my cell phone with the other. I would open my bedroom door while calling 911. And, if no one else was in the apartment, I would just apologize to the operator on the other end of the line and then explain the situation. However, Back in those days, my cell phone wasn't yet a smartphone, and it had this feature I found interesting. If you pressed on a couple specific keys, it would start ringing like someone was calling you. It was meant to be used when you wanted to simulate you were getting a call to get out of a boring conversation, or a tough one. Clumsily, I pressed on those keys, and the phone started ringing. I quickly shut it up, but now it had become clear inside the apartment 
that I was awake. If someone was outside my bedroom, they certainly heard it. What was going to happen? I stopped for a few seconds to hear my surroundings. Nothing. It was dead quiet. I decided to continue with my plan. I dialed 911 with one hand, raised the broomstick with the other, and quickly opened the door. As soon as I did that, someone sprinted in front of me in the corridor and quickly went into the kitchen, closing the door behind them. I screamed, hey, and started pursuing, but a split second later I thought, stop, what if there's someone else in the apartment? What if another intruder sneaks up on you from behind? In front of me was the corridor to the kitchen, but on my left was another corridor that led to the living room and office. The office light was on, so the intruder had been in there, but I didn't know if they had company. I took a step back into the entrance of my room, just so that I wouldn't be caught off guard. Sir, are you there? The 911 operator was calling me on the phone. I quickly explained to him what was happening, gave him my address, and he told me the police were on their way. They had a patrol car nearby, so I should just wait. Then he hung up. The apartment was dead silent. I was terrified. There were only three things I'd been able to notice in the intruder. He had a light-colored sweatshirt with horizontal black lines, dark hair, and he smelled really bad. In fact, the smell was still in the apartment and I could still sense it. The police arrived after seven or eight minutes, which felt like ages. The apartment door was next to the bedroom, so I managed to quickly approach it and unlock the door to let them in. I explained what had happened to the police, and they said that we should go through the whole apartment and check every single hiding place. They had situations before where a burglar had hidden himself for a long period even after the house owners had called the police to later attack them. The apartment wasn't that big, so it was easy to conclude that no one else was hiding there. In the kitchen, it was obvious what had happened. It had these large windows that faced the back of the building, where we had a small community garden. I'd left one of the windows open, and next to it, on the outside, there was a large drain pipe along the wall. The intruder used that pipe to climb to my window and get in. The police left to go look around the neighborhood for someone matching the description of the sweatshirt I described. While they were gone, I could still smell that horrible odor the intruder had left in the apartment. After around 20 minutes, they came back. They couldn't find anyone. The burglar was long gone. Luckily, he didn't have the chance to steal anything while he was in my apartment, but the audacity... I mean, he must have seen the light on in my bedroom through the edges of the door, and he still tried walking past it to steal something from the office. I didn't sleep that night. In the morning, I went to the garden in the back to try to find any further clues about the intruder, but I couldn't find anything. The neighbor in the building next door was at the window, and I called out to her. I told her what had happened. She just smiled and said, Well... Welcome to the neighborhood. We all have stories like that in this place. You should never leave your windows open, and maybe you should consider getting some bars to protect them. The next day I bought a motion alarm and installed it in the kitchen. I never had another experience like that in the apartment. But, to be honest, I never slept the same way in that bedroom, traumatized by those events. At night, I would fear hearing again the sound of the kitchen door snapping out of its place. A few years later, I moved out to a larger apartment in another neighborhood. This time it was on the seventh floor, so it is much harder for intruders to get in through the windows. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. Do me a favor and like the video and drop a comment. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button to always stay up to date with my latest videos. And I want to give a shout out to my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Absinthe Alice, Art and Gaming, Sarah P, Rochelle, 
Christopher, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Kel, Kay, Something Edgy, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Casey Lewis, Sarah T, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Erin, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Astara Rain, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelais, and Alex. If you want to check out the perks of my Patreon channel memberships, or you want to submit a story, all my links and social media can be found in the description below. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you all in the next one.